So this is the um, the youth khutbah training session on October 6th uh, in MCC. And thank you for everybody who's joined and for those who are going to be watching online or watching later. This will be a training that we'll use to help all of the various MS MSAs. Um, okay. So let's just get, jump right into it. What I want to do with this session, we have about three hours. We'll stop after every hour for like a, just a quick five minute break, but it's going to be a little bit intense because we're going to have to get through a lot of uh, material. The first hour, I'm going to go over the fit of the chutbah. It's and we're just going to break it really break it down to the bare minimum of what we need to know. And then the second one is to talk about <coughs> um, delivery methods and how to speak in public speaking. And then the third session, we'll be talking about actually what topics you should, uh, you, should <coughs> excuse me, you should be focusing on in, uh, in the chutbahs. So um, to begin with, let me ask you, let's go right into the bare minimum obligations of, of a chutbah, right? What are, first of all, what is the obligation or what is the, uh, the ruling of Jum'ah and the chutbah? Is it a, is it recommended? Is it is it sunnah? Is it a fard? Yes. Uh, is it a is it a fard? It is a fard. Yeah. Are there <clears throat> are there any conditions to that? Of uh, women, if they're sick or if there's there's uh, certain things. That well, in terms of like actually establishing it. So here's the the first question: Do you have to establish Juma Khutba on your high school or your college campus? Do you have to? No. You don't. Everybody agreed. And why don't you? Why don't you have to establish it? I guess I, this is not a proper environment. It's not a proper environment. Okay, so that's one. It's not a proper environment. Anybody else? The majority of people there are not Muslim. The majority are not Muslim. Okay. Uh, it's, uh, there are other facilities that do a better job at it. Okay. There's other facilities. You're talking about like the massage, yeah. right? There's other massages that do a better job. What else? Uh, maybe so some people in the campus aren't as knowledgeable and they might make a mistake. Oh, well, that's a good point. Some people in the campus are not as knowledgeable and they might make a mistake, right? Okay, so those are all, that's a, that's a good place to start, um, which is we know that the Friday prayer is an obligation and we know that the, the chutbah is a, is a part of that as an obligation. But the question then becomes who has to establish that? Um, and that's, and then what do we do? Do you leave campus and go to a masjid? Or do you stay on campus and do a jum'ah? Or do you stay on campus and just do a Friday session? Um, when I was in high school, I went to high school in Fremont. Anybody go to any of those football games, Huskies? Yeah? yeah you did? Yeah, well, my cousin used to play for them. Like, I oh, really? For, for Washington? Yeah. Washington? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I never really got into to the sports, but they are very like a proud sport. I guess most high schools are, right? Yeah. Football. Like, mm -hmm. Football. <clears throat> so what we did when I was in ninth grade, they started they started an MSA, and that was really good for for me. Even I, I attribute a lot of my my personal development as a Muslim to to work at the MSA, to being at the MSA, to being with other people. The majority of why we are Muslim, especially if you're born into a Muslim family, is your family is who is making you Muslim. Just remember that. The major reason why you are Muslim, and well, ultimately the hidayah is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But how did, because Allah chose you to be Muslim. But how did he choose, how did he make that happen in the world? He put you in a Muslim family. If somebody's a teenager and they're a high school or a college and they have, they have, they're converted to Islam, it's a little bit different, but there's even a lot of what their parents might have given them that set them on the road to Islam. So they can attribute a lot of their first stages of guidance to their parents and making them a good person and teaching them some basics of, um, uh, of traditions that are connected to, to a tradition of revelation. But it's really your parents. And the reason why I say that is because the majority of who you are as a Muslim is, is, is your parents. You're never going to have any sheikh or teacher in your entire life that has a greater right on you than your parents. Because they gave you the most important thing that you have in this life, which is, what is the most important lesson? What is the most important thing that you have as a Muslim? Even more important than Adam. The Shahada. The Shahada, right? 
Isn't that the most important thing? Who gave that to you? Your parents. So they don't ever accept from any person in the future, a sheikh, a teacher, even if they teach you the intricacies of tafsir of the Qur'an, they teach you hifab of the Qur'an, they teach you fit, they teach you anything. Is any of that as great as it, as it is? Is it any, anything better than the shahada? No, the shahada is the, the, the foundation. You got that from your parents. So keep that in mind when you're going to conferences, when you're going to the masjid, when you're involved in the MSA. It's all going to help you develop your Islam, but the foundations were laid by your family. Uh, I'm just saying that because, you know, I mentioned, I said the MSA were really um, pivotal in helping me develop my Islam, and it's developing the Islam. The Islam was there from my, from my parents. So it's really important to have those, uh, those uh, meetings at the MSA and to uh, get together. Whether you as an MSA choose to actually have it on Friday and have it as a Jum'ah or have it as just a, a gathering, that's a choice that you and the MSA will make. Um, because I know when we were, well, let me back up, when I was in high school, they started the MSA. At first, we had a guest speaker and he would come in every Friday and he would actually lead us in a Jum'ah. Then he sent another person um, and then that person said, well, the conditions for Jum'ah prayer are not here, and he feels more comfortable just making it a, a lesson. Does that make sense? So he didn't. And then after that, uh, then I started leading them, but see, I didn't know all the rules. So what you were saying about, you know, how people will, will lead Jum'ah and not... And not uh, so for anybody out there who led Jum'ah behind me when I was in 10th or 11th grade, repeat your prayers. Uh, because it was not a valid Jum'ah. That's why it's important to know the fit and to know how to, to have a valid Jum'ah. But nonetheless, it was still very good to bring the Muslims together on campus. I mean, to give you an idea, we would have, uh, because we didn't know the rules, so I would give the talk, sitting in the science classroom. So it was actually a little bit like this. Do the science classes right now, the teacher, have, he's standing a little higher than the class? And then he has that, that table with the sink in it? Yeah. So our, our science teacher was the advisor. He wasn't Muslim, but a very nice man. And, um, and church going, and he was uh, he, he respected religion, so he was the advisor to our MSA. We had our Friday meetings in in his room. We would uh, I would give the talk, and then the and the students, so some of them would be eating their lunch during my talk, my khutbah, um, and then afterwards move the table and we would pray to Uh Whether or not that was a valid Jum'ah, I would probably say it's not valid. Because I now, after having studied and looking back, I'm, oh wow, I missed this point and I missed this point. Um, but it was good for the Muslims to get together and to you know, go through that process to congregate, to talk to each other. But that's a choice that you'll make, whether we actually do it as a chutbah, whether we bring in an outside speaker. I think it's always best to have the people from the MSA trained in how to, 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 how to do this. So let's just jump right into the, the basics of, uh, of, of the Jum'ah. Uh, what are... The 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 uh, the things that makes a Jum'a khutbah and a Jum'a prayer valid. So we'll just go and see what everybody has. Salawat in the prophet, or what's that? Like make salawat. And you just, like, it's like that's like the one thing that's mandatory. And you can, like make salawat first, and then speaking is like um, like that's option, right? So um, and the reason I'll explain why I'm doing this as a grid. Um, Okay, so you said um, salawat, like Sydney prayers on the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, right? Yeah. Okay, what else? Like the khutbah Arabic part. The khutbah Arabic part, yeah. right? So, um, Starts off with an adhan. What's that? The first starts off with an adhan that the uh, muaddin gives. And then okay. They start off. And is that something that if, if it's not there, the jum'ah is invalid? I'm not sure, but okay. It? But th that's that's what we're gonna we're gonna start. So let's yeah. say, um, so the adhan. All right. What else? English <clears throat> chutbah. What's that? English chutbah. English chutbah? Right, uh, whatever language, you're, whatever, whatever country you're in, what's the national language. Okay, so national language. 
All right. What else? <clears throat> don't worry if you don't know all the answers, because that's what this is. That's what today is all about, right? Well, there has to be like a an intention. Intention. I mean, that's right. what you should start with. So, yeah. So we're gonna have to. We're gonna have intention. Um, well, the the thing is that all actions. Are, are dependent on intention, so I'll, I'll put that up here. Uh, I'll put that up here. Intention. Okay. Like you mean with uh, we'll do? We'll do. Yeah, that's actually across the board. Let me actually do, do this. Okay, anybody have any, anything else? You can just say it. Uh, with it. Anything else comes to mind? Like the the integral. Just think about when you go to a Jum'ah and say at the Masjid, you see the Imams doing different things during the football. What are some of those things that you notice um, that should be there in the football? Yes. Between the Arabic and there's usually blog, right? the the pause, right? The pause or the city, right? Yeah. All right. What else? Yeah. Well, I think Salah. You see that? Well, I think Salah. Okay. Call to prayer. So call to call to Iqama. What else? Okay, well, let's just start. What I wanted to do with this is just show you, we know that our, um, according to uh, our deen, the, the sunnah of the Prophet and the way of the Quran and the sunnah was preserved by um, by the four madhabs, right? So there's Shafi'i, Hanafi, Maliki, and then Hanbali. And each one of those schools have different requirements for what is required for a Jum'ah khutbah. I put here, these are these are actually extra things. So the call to iqamah, you don't have to, like, the, as a bare minimum, even if this call to iqamah is not there, the khutbah is still valid. Does that make sense? If there's no if there's no English khutbah, and I'll explain like that, the, the khutbah is still valid. If there's no adhan, the, the, the khutbah is still valid. These ones are all. So everyone is going to say that there has to be an intention because of the hadith innam al-a'mal bin niyat. Verily actions are by their intention, right? So if you stand up and you start going through the motions of a prayer and somebody says, what are you doing? I'm like, I don't know, I was just going through the motions of the prayer. You didn't have an intention. So the action that ibadah is not there. So all actions of ibadah have to have an intention. Uh, they all say you have to have wudu. They all say you have to have an Arabic khutbah, but the difference is like what is the minimum of, of that? And they generally all say that there's there has to be a, a pause for a city. The only school that actually requires salawat on the Prophet وسلم, as a requirement is the Shafi'i school. Um, the Arabic khutbah here um, in the, the Shafi'i school, yes, he, they require Arabic khutbah, but you can add in um, something else. You can't add in another language. In the Hanafi, they say, yes, you have to have Arabic and no long pause. Now, generally, the khutbah that I'm saying, the only one that I see most MSAs should be following is the Hanafi school. So we're going to be focusing on the fifth of the Hanafi school, and I'll, and I'll, exact, and I'll explain why. No long pause, the same thing here, no long pause. So you know how um, a lot of People at most masajid will have like they'll they'll do an Arabic introduction and then maybe a 20 or 30 minute English lecture and then they sit down and they stand up a little bit of Arabic and then and then English. So when we look at this from the fiqh, the law, think of those that English as if it, as if it's a pause. So what if I went up there and I said uh, you know Alhamdulillah, Salatu Wassalamu Ala Rasulillah, Amma Ba'athu Ya Ibadullah, Taqullah, and then I'm quiet for 20 minutes. And then I start. Is that pause problematic in the khutbah or not? Okay, so 
When we speak another language other than Arabic, it's like making a pause. The Shafi'is, um, at least from my understanding and speaking to people who have studied and followed the Shafi'i school, it's okay to have that Arabic and then the English and then the Arabic and then the English and then the prayer. That pause, there's no, there's no, there's no problem with the pause. Does that make sense? The Hanafis, there is an issue with that, and the Malikis also have an issue with that. So that's why in a, in, in a number of masajid, you'll see where the English talk is presented as a bayan. Have you noticed that? So the speaker will actually sit down and give the English talk, in, in uh, or give the majority of the lesson, the talk, in that English part, and then after that, then they'll stand up on the minbar and just give a Arabic-only khutbah. Does that make sense? You, has everybody seen that? Yeah. Have you ever seen that? So basically, like you'll see, the, the person will be sitting down giving a talk <clears throat> in English, and then after that English talk is done, then they'll stand up on the minbar and begin begin the actual official khutbah. Sometimes. Okay. So if you've seen that, basically, and the term that's used for that is they call it bayan. Now that's not something that was originally something the Prophet ﷺ did to have a bayan before the khutbah. But it solves the issue of, if for the majority of the world, if we just gave in all Arabic khutbah, are most people going to benefit from that in the lesson, in the, in the Jum'ah? They're not. So what people said is like, okay, let's, and I've seen this even in Arab, the Arab world, sometimes they do this. In Mauritania, I've seen some of the top scholars, they give a long Arabic speech, and then a short khutbah. So the difference is, excuse me, the difference would be that during that bayan, you know the prohibition of talking while the person is, while the khatib is on the mimba? Can you technically talk to your friend during the bayan? Yes or no? No. You can't? Why not? Because it's disrespectful. Well, if it's, it's disrespectful, yes, it's not adab, so we shouldn't talk. But is it haram, like it's haram to speak during the khutbah? It's not because it's the bayan. But, of course, people should, you should, they should, they should treat it like the bayan. So in your MSA, you can choose one of you can choose those two uh, those two methods. You can choose ban, just give a long English talk, and then the two short Arabic khutbahs and then the prayer. And I'll explain how to do that. Or you can you can do where you added the English, but you're going to have to. Um, I'll I'll explain how we can how, how we can address that. Um, but let's just get through the fit of what are some of the basic the, the bare minimum. So the salawat, the shafi'is say you have to have a salawat. The shafi'is also have to say an order to taqwa. You have to have an order to taqwa. Um, <clears throat> you also have to have one of their requirements is dua for the believers. Now, the, one of the reasons why I'm mentioning all of the various ones is because we're going to stick with the Hanafi school for like how to do a khutbah at an MSA. But you should include aspects of the Shafi'i school just to cover the grounds. Does that make sense? So that if somebody has studied the Shafi'i school and he says, oh, well, you know, your khutbah wasn't valid because in my school you have to have an order to taqwa. So they have to have, there's a uh, recitation of an ayah. Well, it's not here. Um, but uh, they also have uh, some other the, the requirements. Um, the, the Hanafis, the only requirement is dhikr. You have to do the dhikr. For those of you who uh, memorize Surah Jum'ah or memorize the Quran, Allah says, Fasa'awira dhikrillah. Like we were talking about Jum'ah. So that was the proof of the Hanafi scholars that Allah says for the Jum'ah, go to the dhikr of Allah. It's a powerful proof, too. Go to the dhikr of Allah. So the Hanafi scholars considered that as long as some form of dhikr is present in the khutbah, then that's, that, that's what the khutbah is. The, um, the, the, the Malikis uh, considered that the bare minimum of a khutbah is that it has to be um, uh, uh, what the Arabs knew as a khutbah. So the Malikis considered, they, they, looked, they, said, they said what the Arabs considered was a khutbah, which was basically uh, a speech in Arabic that is calling people to something. The Shafi'i said, no, it's specifically you have to say law in the order form. It has to be in order. So um, you'll hear people saying in English, I join you and I join myself to have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you're formulating your khutbah, the Arabic portion, you should have dhikr in there. 
You should have Arabic because all of them say Arabic. You should include some order of taqwa, and we can talk about like a, a, a basic form format. If you mention one of the ayahs, uh, one of the ayahs where Allah is mentioning taqwa with an order to taqwa, you get you get a lot of things in that in that ayah. You get the Shafi'is order to taqwa. You get the Hanafis um, uh, order to uh, that, that there has to be dhikr because the Quran is is a form of dhikr and it is a <clears throat> it is a portion of what the Manichees would consider to be a uh, um, a valid khutbah. So, <clears throat> um, how many people do you need for jam Jamaat? Yes, at least two, like someone, at least two people. Okay, so you say two people. In the congregation? Yeah, at least. Okay. What I think for the Hanafis it's three. Three. Yeah, for the Hanafis it's three. It's three plus the imam, right? Isn't that what it is? Or is it two I plus think the imam? It's two plus imam. So yeah. adhan, imam, and then one person in the congregation. Okay, so okay. three all together. So so three all together, um, which is two plus the imam. The Manakis consider thirteen, twelve plus the imam. And the Shafi'i is considered 40, so 39 plus the Imam. <clears throat> and all of this difference comes out from what constitutes a Jama'ah, what constitutes a congregation. So you can see in most, in most MSAs, which one are you going to, which one might you hit? The Hanafi. The Hanafi, definitely, right? For sure. Uh, the Shafi'i, unless you're at a college MSA, you're probably not, and this is 40 men, this is all we're talking about men, so that's not including the, any sisters that are into it. So it's 40, um, it's 40 men. Um, now you might get in your MSA 13, but then you come into another problem that, that the Matic is considered, which is it has to be in a masjid. Have you ever heard anybody say, oh, Jamaat has to be in a masjid? So you might have heard that because, and the reason why I'm giving you this grid is because you might hear different things from different people, and they're like, oh, Jumu'ah is this, or Jumu'ah is this, and a, a khutbah has to have this. What, one of the main things, you're not going to master all of the different uh, medhab fits, but in the future, if, if something com comes up to you in your MSA and they say, oh, we can't do that, that's not valid, don't think that it's absolute. Say, oh, which medhab says that? Can you look that up? Can you get a, a reference point for that? So that's one of the things that you're going to do as you're um, working uh, for the, the chuppahs in your... So the Maniki school, that's not going to work at a... It's not going to work actually at most places. It's not going to work at a uh, hospital chapel. chapel. It's not going to work at a Jum'ah. It's not... Uh, sorry, at a uh, MSA. You're using a classroom. It's not going to use it at... Uh, not going to work at a college campus. It's not going to work in a prison. I do a lot of work in the prisons, and they have Jum'ah in the prisons. It's not going to work in an open field. Who's ever prayed Jum'ah in an open field? Yeah? Okay. So, um, if, if we, um, and that's why I advise even people who follow the Vatican school, say, look, you know, if you, if you follow this, what would happen? Think of what would happen to Jum'ah in America if people were like, it only has to be in a masjid. All of the MSAs are the question. All of the companies who has uh, uh, family uh, fathers that go to Jum'ah at Facebook, Google, Cisco, Sun, you know, all, does the Sun even exist anymore? Sun or Microsystems? That word, word Google. Google. Oracle, thank you. Say Oracle or any of these other ones. They have the Jum'ahs on the on the campus. So so we're looking really at the Hanafi uh, the school for your uh, for your for your fit. So one of the things is after this. Try your best to learn the Hanafi fiqh, according, uh, the, the, the Jum'ah khutbah, according, and, and, and the, um, uh, the, uh, the Jum'ah rules, according to the Hanafi school. And I'll share, we'll collect everybody's emails, and I will share um, some more information uh, about that. But we're just going to do really quickly. So there has to be dhikr, no long pause, um, and there has to be three people. So it's pretty simple. So basically, any type of dhikr, stand up, any type of dhikr, sit down, take a pause, stand up, any type of dhikr, and then the prayer begins. But you should maintain some of the formalities of the football to include the sunnahs, like, and then some of what the others would consider sunnah, like salawat, the shafi'is consider that an obligation, the du'a for the believers. So we'll give you a format that has like 
some of these. Any questions on this? Or is this confusing? Yes. So, so, so the, the things that are mandatory for honeybees is the girdle, no long pause, and salah, right? And three people, and it has to be in Arabic. Yeah. yeah. Arabic thicker than the English, <coughs> right? Or Well, so, okay, so now if you do, but you have no long pause. So what would be a way you could get around that? What I've seen other, what some people do, and I actually um, uh, do this myself as well, is that you start off, if you start off with some Arabic, and then go into English, and it's a long pause, it's, it's, it's pretty long, then before you sit down, do some more components of the Arabic chutbah, some more dhikr, mention a couple of ayahs, you know, alhamdulillah, and then sit down. So, so technically, um, what it would look like is something like, um, so you're, you, you stand up, you have uh, an Arabic intro, then you have English, then you have some more Arabic dhikr just to fulfill the, the bare minimums, and then you sit down, then you stand up, and then you can do either this format again, or just go through, through Arabic, short English, and then you pray. So you go Arabic, English, then Arabic dhikr, sit, then you go to Arabic again, and then short English? You don't have to do short English. This is the only thing that is the, the, that is the obligation. And I'll share with you a bare minimum obligation, because if you're, sometimes people are in a situation where they have to do like a 10 minute prayer or 15 minute prayer. And actually the sunnah is, I, I mean when I was in uh, Mauritania study and we would go to Jum'ah, you know how long the whole entire Jum'ah process is? About 10 minutes. So this idea of Jum'ah being like 45 minutes, an hour, that's really because the speeches have become longer. But the, according to the Prophet ﷺ, the way he conducted the Jum'ahs is that his sunnah is, he would read in the prayer, and then he would have the, um, the khutbah. Which one would be longer, the prayer or the, the khutbah? Prayer. Prayer. Hmm? prayer. According to the sunnah. Now, which masjid have you ever been where the prayer of the Jum'ah is longer than the khutbah? You've never seen that, right? Um, and so that's at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, but one of the, the reasons why that's changed is because a lot of the scholars said, look, this, is the this might be the only time people are coming to the masjid, listening to a talk. We, this is also now going to be a, a reminder as well as a lesson as well. So what do they change? What's that? So now the khutbah is longer than the prayer. I mean, wouldn't you say that the majority of khutbahs that you heard are longer than the actual prayer? Yeah. yeah. Um, unless you go, uh, you know, to some of the masajid where they do the bayan in English and the khutbah is Arabic, and then they read um, a longer surah, uh, like if they read surah al Jumu'ah, which or sabih ismaru bikanala, you know, it might be longer than the khutbah. So, but don't say like, okay, you know what we're going to do at our MSA? We're going to return to the sunnah and we're going to do a short khutbah and a long prayer. Like, don't go against the. The, the, the tide of what the, the Muslim community at large has said, look, you know, this is what we're going to do. We're going to have longer lessons because of the, 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 our times and the need of our times. Um, so any questions on the... Yeah? Yeah, I'm curious, does the validity of the Jummah rest on the Imam or the congregation? So what I mean by that is if, uh, if it's valid for the Imam, is it valid for the entire congregation? For the khutbah or the yeah, prayer? Uh, for the khutbah. Because in prayer, for example, if mm -hmm. the imam is praying according to his madhab and right. it's valid for him, then it, the congregation should be valid for them. As it well. is, yeah. Okay. But I wonder if Jumu operates in the same Oh, way. I see. Okay, same, same. Uh, so the question was, if the Jumu'ah, if the khutbah is valid for the imam, is it valid for the congregation? Because if you, we know there's differences in the madhab of fit, where, say, the wudu, according to the Hanafi school, if a, uh, it's, not, it's not valid according to the Maliki's for whatever reason, like the Hanafis don't need an intention when you watch, right? So if you jump into a shower, jump into a pool, you come out, you have wudu. But in the Malikis, you actually have to have an intention. Um, so, but if a Maliki prays behind a Hanafi, the prayer is valid because as long as that Imam intends it to be, the uh, note feels it to be valid, that's sufficient, and, we, and other um, people of other schools can follow that Imam. So it's a very good question, which is if the Imam, if the chutbah is according to the um, um, uh, valid according to the Imam, does it go according to the Jama'ah as well? The difference is is that one of the the, um, the, the the conditions of, or I should say, the Jama'ah prayer 
because the the jama'a and the khutbah are are inter like they're dependent on each other. So say for example an imam, even if he gives a valid khutbah and but he doesn't have a jama'a to pray with him, is his prayer valid? Think about it. Man stands up, he has no jama'a to pray with him. He gives a valid khutbah, it's valid in his madhab, but he has no jama'a. It's just him. No it's just him. Is that valid? No. And if a jama'a prays on their own without the khatib, is it valid? Okay, and that, so that's different than a regular jama'a. If the imam prays and nobody's behind him, is his prayer still valid? So they're, they're, the, the validity of their prayers, the, the imam in a normal prayer and the jama'a are independent. Whereas in jum'a, they're interdependent. That's why you have to be, that you have to catch the khutbah to be able to pray two rakats. So there's a, there's a long discussion. We won't go into that today. If somebody comes late and they miss the khutbah, do they, do they pray four rakats to make up or do they pray two and so forth? But we won't get into all of that. Hopefully everybody at the MSA, they're coming on time, you know, and yes. So like, uh, you know how you say you have to like, come for the khutbah on time? Sorry, but does that I yes. answer your question? Okay. So like, what if you come in, uh, like, uh, if the khutbah already started and it's like midway, does it still count for you to pray behind him? The khutbah starts midway? Like, uh, if uh, he already started and you come midway, yeah. it's almost finished. So yeah, you, uh, If you come in and the jama'ah is in the khutbah or the prayer, you join in at whatever point it is. The question is, if you miss a couple of rakahs of the prayer, is uh, if you miss, you, if you catch the, the one rakah with the imam, you got the whole the whole jama'ah, including the khutbah. Um, okay, so any questions on this before we go in now? Now this is just kind of like a general overview, so you see the different methods. Now we're just going to focus on um, some of the elements of like how are we going to actually implement that. If you got a phone, just go ahead and take a picture of that. I will too. And I'm going to probably put this into a like a, a table and then email it out to everybody as well. Um, okay, so so now let's go into what that football will actually look like. Okay, so since you got you got the a classroom that you're doing the football in or if it's a college and there's a, a chapel um, that you're using, or a general room. Um, oh, that's another thing that we started out. The time. What is the time of Jum'ah? When the Vohar starts. When the Vohar starts. Okay, so now let's just go into time. Uh, time is when uh, Vohar begins. So let's just say, um, say this is the line of when Vohar actually begins. Um, let's just say this is... 138. Okay, so if you do, when is the, the ending time of Jum'ah Khutbah time? Hmm? When's the latest you can do it? Asr time. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you got Asr time. So you got between Bohr and Asr to do your Jum'ah Khutbah. You'll find some masajid that do Jum'ah here. Have you ever seen that? Say they do it at like 1230. You're, has anybody ever seen that? And this is important, especially probably more, more so when you get to a, a college MSA, or even if you're dealing with like lunch, like at your high school, when's lunch start? Start at 12.38. So, oh, so okay, so at, at your high school, it starts at 12.30? Yeah. And then goes to what time? 1.08. 12.30 One, to 1.08. To 1.08. Yeah. What about your high school? Um, 12.30 to 1.00. Okay. Wow, you guys have short lunches. Half an hour, yeah. Half an hour. Yeah. And this is exact, right? You're like 12.30 to 1.08. You have 38 minutes to ingest and digest your food. <laughs> when I oh, when yeah. you were at uh, your high school. Same thing with 12.30 to 1.08. Okay. Oh, you're not in high school, right? Okay, so. Uh, anybody else? Same. Same. So right here, you already got a problem. It's like Gohor's not in. If Gohor's coming in at 1.38, what do you do? When we were having uh, our Jum'ahs, one of the reasons, remember I, uh, I shared at the beginning, we had a person who was coming in, he would lead us in Jum'ah, then another person came in and he did not lead us. Well, one of the reasons why is our lunch was at 12.30, so it was before Dhoha. So the only school that allows for Jum'ah before Dhoha time is the Hanbali school. So this is a Hanbali, uh, Hanbali opinion. It's a Hanbali opinion. And 
So you'll see big messages like MSMCA, they have a Jum'ah before uh, the uh, before the hood comes in, and then they have one or two after after it. Some MSAs because they're like, look, this is our only chance, especially in the winter time. Well, the winter time maybe the hood will come in, but uh, but the point is that you might be in an MSA where some members are like, oh, it's okay, we can do Jum'ah before the hood. And if you don't know there's this difference in the Madahib, somebody's like, no, you can't do it because I asked the scholar and he said it's invalid. No, I asked the scholar and he said it is valid. And that's what happened at our Jum'ah. We had one person that was coming out. He was actually leading Jum'ah for us at 12.30 because he followed this opinion. The person who came after him didn't uh, follow this opinion, so he just gave us a talk and then we did two rakahs of Nafila. So that was just there. You know, I don't suggest that, you know, because that's kind of like a little bit like if, if people want to do just a talk and Dukhur and Jum'ah, that's fine. Uh, but don't like switch stuff around. Yeah. So basically, what, whatever school of Islam follows, the rest of the people will follow. Well, th that's a good question. It goes back. And what was your name, brother? Yusuf. Yusuf. Yusuf's question, which is, uh, which is, if the khutbah is valid according to the Imam, can it be valid according to the Jama'ah? But because they're in interdependent, you have to make sure that whatever school you're following, it's also valid with the other school. Unless you choose to follow that school. For that, uh, for for that portion of the cookbook, uh, but as an example, remember we were saying one of the what are one of the Shafi'i requirements of Jum'ah? There should be like the intention to taqwa. Um, Order to taqwa, right? Taqwa. The Hanbalis have the same thing as well. But did the Hanafis have it? No. No. So if you did a Hanafi Jum'ah, but you prayed it before Dhuhr and you forgot the order to taqwa, the Hanbali would say that's not valid, and the Hanafi would say that's not valid, right? So if, we're, if somebody is going to follow the Hanbali school, learn the Hanbali fiqh. But where are the Hanbali teachers? Where are the Hanbali books? Where, who's going to you know, be able to, to figure that out? So if you're in this, in this, and then the other, the other issue that this causes is if you know, a lot of people are just, they're going to ask their teachers or their local imams, and they'll be like, don't do it before Dohar, don't do it before Dohar. So if you're in this constraint, then, then just have a, you know, get together and have a discussion and you know, and you don't really even have to do it on, on Jum'ah. That, that's a situation where you're not even able to pray uh, uh, Jum'ah. But if, if the MSA says, you know what, we, we feel that it's really important for us to have a Jum'ah, then, then this opinion does exist. And the reason why the Hanbalis considered it valid to have it before Jum'ah is they said, well, Jum'ah, think of another prayer that resembles Jum'ah prayer. you got a khutbah. Instead of four rak'ahs, you have two khutbahs and two rak'ahs. What's another prayer that we're familiar with that has something like that? Fajr. What's that? Fajr. It doesn't have a khutbah though, right? Fajr doesn't have a khutbah. Oh, then Eid prayer. Eid prayer, exactly. So uh, Ahmed ibn Muhammad said, he said, the, because, he said, the sunnah of two khutbahs, two, two rak'ahs is kind of in the same category. And when can you pray Eid prayer? Uh, after Fajr. Anytime after Fajr? So from Fajr, all the way till actually till Dhuhr. Oh. So in that sense, he said, because you can have Eid before Dhuhr, Jum'ah is like Eid, and so you can do it before Dhuhr. So you'll hear a lot of people, especially, one of the things that happens with MSAs is people, especially when you get to college, is people are coming from a lot of different communities. So maybe while you're in high school, the majority of Muslims you see at your, at your MSA are coming from your local masajid that you're familiar with. So if you're at Doherty Valley, you probably see people from what? Walnut Creek Masjid, as, uh, San Ramon, well, mostly San Ramon Valley Islamic Center, right? Yeah. Service? Yeah. Maybe some MCC goers? Yeah. Okay. And generally, service and MCC is like of the same uh, understanding, right? So you're not going to get this divergent view. But if you went to UC Berkeley or UC Davis or, uh, you know, some of the other UCs, you're going to get people from all over the country, all over the state, and they're really going, you, you might have a lot of people that say, look, our masjid in our hometown, we do Jum'ah before Dhuhr, and we don't know why, but they do it. My imam does it. Let's do that here. So that's something you're going to have to work out with the MSA. And what I would say, if an individual doesn't feel comfortable with this, but the majority do, don't make it an issue. To where they're like, you know, I'm going to revive the sunnah of the messenger of Allah, and we're going to prevent this, you know, and we're going to follow the sunnah according to Al-Khalifa, or Malik, or Shafi'i. You know, just say, okay, brothers, I'm going to voice my opinion. I don't think we should do that. The, the, the majority of the scholars say it shouldn't happen after Dhuhr. 
Even the Hanbalis would say it's valid after Dhuhr, so let's go with the safer opinion. But if they want to do that and you don't feel comfortable, then just kind of silently, you know, move move out of that, uh, out of that, uh, leading that, that prayer if you don't feel comfortable with it. So does this time issue make sense? Yeah. Uh, at Miami State, what we do is, um, uh, in winter when, like, the times coincide, that's, mm -hmm. when, that's the only time that we pray, like, Joma there. Other times it's just, like, a congregation. So you do just a uh, congregation, just get together? Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah so that's good. Yeah. I mean, uh, one of the problems is usually the Jumas at the Masajid are early or at the one one o'clock yeah. time or something. So, uh, so if you're congregating out of school, you don't have exactly. Yeah. But maybe you could do it after school if the timing works. Right. Out, so like two thirty. Yeah, and that's one of the things. Like as as your MSA, if the Masajid are not doing that, you can request them to have a second Juma at the Masjid. Which that also goes back to the Fiqh. You know, other some schools don't allow for second Juma as the Hanafis do. So that's why it's generally. It's easiest to just go with the Hanafi school for, for that. Um, the MCC, I know they do a third, uh, what is it, a third Jum'ah? They do a third Jum'ah for the youth to coincide with the uh, with, with the high school and letting out. Uh. But you're saying in the winter time it's an issue? Uh, it's, um, we pray when like, we only pray Jum'ah when like the times work out. Okay, yeah, because like in the winter time, Lolo should be in by 12.30, right? Yeah, so I think that's what M MCC here they do. They only do the third jumah for the high schoolers uh, until the time changes to where you can actually do jumah on your campus. So, any questions on the time? All right. Um, so, we talked about uh, the minimum of a congregation. Um, the minimum of a uh, chutbah. Then, are there any other fifth points in terms of how to? So it's pretty simple in terms of once a person knows knows those those elements that you have the two chutbahs, you have the sitting, and then you have um, then you have the the, the, the two rakats. Um, Okay, any questions before I move on to... Everybody's clear? Anybody want to? Yes? I have some technical questions. Yeah, go ahead. And if they're not appropriate, you can ignore them. I'm curious, um, I've thought of this idea before, but the bayan, uh, there's no requirement to who can or cannot give the bayan. Mm -hmm. and so I was wondering if for MSAs maybe, and I don't want to seem like progressive either. But the sister gives the bayan? Exactly. Okay, so that's a question. Uh, can, uh, because the bayan, there's no requirements for it. We talked about the bayan earlier. There's no requirements for the ban. It's not like the khutbah. It can be given in any language. You can speak during it. It's not edit to speak when the, you know, the speaker is up there. Um, but um, since there are no requirements, can a sister give the ban? And that's a very, very good question because one of, one of the things we didn't talk about is that when we say the imam and the congregation have to be males. There's no doubt about that. You know, and especially now in this day and age where um, there's a lot of discussion about feminism and progressivism and modernism and all these isms um, and you know patriarchy and chauvinism and all of these dis uh, discussions and why can't women lead the lead the Jum'ah prayers? Uh, you might not hear that discussion and that type of rhetoric at the high school level, but when you get into the, the university level, you will hear it, and it's going to become more and more and more. So a couple of years ago, you know, the first woman-led Jum'ah was done in New York. Since then, there has been a number of other masajid. There's one in L.A. where they do women-led Jum'ah, but it's a woman imam and a woman congregation. Now, up here in Berkeley, they have a new masjid where it's a woman imam and a mixed congregation. And they're looking at this as like, you know, progressive and we're, 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 we're throwing off the shackles of patriarchy and so on and so forth. Whereas for us, our deen is from Allah and His Messenger, preserved by the scholars, and interpreted by their understanding. Right? That's where we get our deen. So the imam, even in the Arabic language, the word imam can only be used for a male. You don't have a, you don't have a female, you don't say call a, a female an imamah. It doesn't work even linguistically in the Arabic language. Um, now, the Shafi'i school allows for a woman to lead a female congregation, so if, if, a, if a group of women said, you know what, we want to, we want to have our own congregation for other than Jum'ah prayer, but Jum'ah is an obligation upon men, 
to be established by men. And that's that's clear in our sunnah, the four madhabs are in agreement in it, that's what's been going on, the, the understanding and the practice for 1400 years. We don't need people now to come along and say, oh, we figured out a better way. At the same time, we want to make sure that we give some solutions so that we don't cause this extreme, um, you know, uh, kind of like the, just there's, there's only two sides. You either follow the way we've been doing it, or we make a change. So one change that we talked about earlier is the introduction of a bayan, right? Because did the prophet introduce a bayan? No, he didn't. But the community saw, okay, there is a need for a bayan. There is a need for a longer discussion. There's a need for a discussion in the language of the people. So let's introduce the bayan. So one of the one of the things that I know some MSAs have done, and I'm going to get directly to your question, Yusuf. Is, um, is that they have had uh, cooperation between the brothers and the sisters to where the sus sisters write the chutbahs and the brothers um, uh, deliver the chutbahs. Since the delivery has to happen you know, with the, the men and the prayer leading with the men, then have the sisters included in, in that sense. If a sister now, um, and this is the first time I'm going to think about it, but it's a, it's, it makes sense if a sister delivers a bayan, and then the actual khutbah and the, those technical components in the prayer is delivered by the, 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 the brothers. There's nothing that would prevent that from happening. I think that's something that the, the, the jama'ah is going to, you know, that congregation is going to have to, have to discuss. Um, you know, they're going to, there's going to be people that will come up and say, oh, uh, a woman shouldn't be speaking publicly. That's probably one, um, one, uh, argument against that, and so that has to be dealt with separately, like, okay, let's actually look into this. Is that something cultural? Is there a discussion amongst the scholars? The answer is yes, there is a discussion amongst the scholars. Is there a difference of opinion on whether or not a woman can speak in front of men, and actually not only speak in front of men, but you know, when you speak, you raise your voice. So that's one discussion. So a very powerful proof for the permissibility of a woman speaking in public in front of men is one time Omar was, was, was in the masjid giving a talk and he was actually going to, he was as the Khalifa, he was going to issue an executive order. You're familiar with the story? Uh, okay. He was going to issue an executive order to put a cap on the dowries that were being given to women. Because as the Muslim community grew, like at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, in those early days, were they poor or were they wealthy? Poor. They were poor, right? They, had, they didn't have much wealth. But as the empire grew, and now more lands are coming in, there was a lot of wealth. And the Prophet ﷺ actually foretold this. He said, you're going to see a time where you're going to get a lot of wealth. By the time of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, who is Umar's anhu's great-grandson, they got to a point where they could not find a Muslim that would receive zakat. The wealth had been distributed, and they got it out. They, could, they couldn't find somebody to get zakat. So you know what they started doing? They started paying... Uh, dowries of, of single men to get married. They're like, let's just find new categories of people. So, um, uh, so at the time of Omar, now the wealth is increasing, the dowries are increasing as well, and so Omar says, I'm going to put a cap on the dowries. And so a woman outside of the masjid actually said, oh, Omar, are you going to do that? And Allah says, even if you give them qintara, let's have the hafal help us out, um, you know the qintara, minat the heavy, the ayah, are you a half of this one, You're not? There's an ayah that mentions, talking about the dowries, that the dowry traditionally was given by the man, by the husband to be the groom, to the wali, the guardian of the woman, to protect and to ensure that she gets it and that it's delivered to her. So because it's given to, it's given to the wali, he has to make sure to turn it over to the woman. That's her property. And so the Quran is saying that if you, even if you are given a, in thought, a huge amount of Gold, a treasure room full of gold, a treasure chest full of gold, give everything to her. So if Allah is saying in the Quran, even if you, the wali, are getting a tintar, give it to the girl, right? Give it to the woman. And so Omar said, oh yeah, that is a proof that you can have a large extravagant dow uh, dowry. And he said, and he, and he stopped it. So that's one of the proof that, that the, the Sahabiyats were allowed to speak in the presence of women, of, of men. And there's other uh, others as well. Um, so I, I think that that, that could be a possibility, um, and I, I think those type of options should be explored because now what's happening, even in some local, uh, one, I know for a fact, one local university, where the women are actually saying, we want to have a woman-led Jum'ah on campus. So what's, what was happening like in, 
in fringe massage, let me, let me put it that way, where they're trying to, they're moving away from the sunnah. Now that, that type of thing is coming into the campus. So as you go to the college campuses, you will see that, and you should be prepared. So if you say, okay, sisters, can you write the khutbas and we'll deliver it? That way we ensure your voice is being heard. That's one way. Okay, sisters, you want to give a bayan beforehand? Um, now the argument, they might say, well, you know, because people think the khutbah is the only part that you have to be there. I mean, how many people have timed themselves to be at the masjid just for the khutbah part and skip the bayan? Be honest, I'm going to raise my hand and say I've done that sometimes. Nobody's here? Oh man, I just exposed yeah. myself. <laughs> Most of the places I go don't do the bayan thing. They don't do the bayan thing? Okay. All right, well. But otherwise I would have. You would have? Okay, well, thank you, Yusuf. I appreciate it. Now it's like, hi, my name is Rami, and sometimes I skip the bayan. Uh, but we have it playing in our office. We're like a couple blocks from the message. So we listen to the bayan from the first. Then we were joking. We're like, why don't we just pray Jum'ah here at the office? We hear the imam. But that's a, you can't do that. There's another fifth discussion for that. You know, can, you, can we watch Jum'ah in Mecca and pray with them? You know? um, so does that answer your question, Yusuf? There's nothing that would preclude that. There are some arguments against that. They should just... Uh, but I think that might be a good um, a good solution because we can't say, look, this is what we are going to stick to, recognizing that there's a tide rising over here, that we're not giving a viable solution that is congruent at least with the understanding of, of some of our valid scholarship within Ahl Sunnah and Jamaah. Any other questions? We we'll take a short break in about ten minutes, but we'll just wrap up the fifth portion um, so that everybody has a an idea. So basically, if, if you want to have a, um, a good, well-rounded khutbah, you, have, you should have, and I'll write this up on the, the board, or actually, I'll just, basically it's like this. You have alhamdulillah, you put some hamd in there, salat upon the Prophet sallallahu an order to taqwa and an ayah, or you can join those two with an ayah that orders to taqwa. Does that make sense? And you got it. Because the whole point of the khutbah and this is where the scholars differ, you know, the, the, the various madah, like I said it there. Okay, Jum'ah needs a Jama'ah. What is what what, what what does the Prophet mean by saying a Jama'ah? Right? He didn't he didn't explain to a Jama'ah. So some said, okay, we're gonna look at linguistically. What did the Arabic Arabs, when they use the Arabic language, what did they consider a Jama'ah? 40, 13, 3. You know, because according to the according to Arabic, the well, you can use the, the plural, like if I said enta. If I say entuma, what does that mean? Enta means what? You one. Entuma means what? You two. You two. At what point can I refer to you as entum? Which is the plural, right? At what point? If I'm speaking to you, how many people do I need along with you to say entum? Three. Hmm? Is it three? It's actually two. Two people. Two people. So that's the, that's a strong proof from the, the, the Hanafi school. It says if you have two people on the imam, that's the two people is a qadl jama'ah. According to the Arabs, the Arabic use, uh, the use of the language. So, but you can see how an Imam Malik has his proof, Imam Shafi has his proof. So they have these different proofs in terms of how they're defining what a Jama'ah is. All right, we're going with the three because we're going we're gonna to see that the, uh, the Hanafi school, it does not have to have, be happen in a masjid. Um, but now when we get to what is a khutbah, right? The, the, the sunnah is telling us about having a khutbah. Well, what is defined as a khutbah? And the, 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 some of the explanations is that it's a dhikr, according to Hanifa, according to the Manikis, it's a reminder, according to the Shafi'is, it's an order to taqwa. That's the bare minimum. Does that make sense? So it's either a dhikr, a reminder, or an order to taqwa. Well, let's put all three of those together by saying, uh, you know, ittaqullaha haqqa tuqati. So we got the order to dhikr. I mean, we got an order to taqwa. We got a dhikr because it's from the Quran. And there's a reminder to have taqwa of Allah. So try your best to have those, some of those ayahs in there that have um, an order to taqwa in, in, in there. And unfortunately, many masajid, especially the ones who, where you go to the ones where they have like the bayan and then the khutbah, they'll have an Arabic khutbah, but, they, but if you listen closely, you will not hear an order to taqwa. And so Shafi'is who are there, in fact, there was an imam here in the Bay Area, I was talking to him, I said, you know, uh, I, I, uh, I encourage you as Hanafi shiyukh and Hanafi imams, Please include in your uh, khutbahs an order to taqwa in the form of ittaqullah because there's there might be shafi'is in the attendance. He said, actually, you know what? One time there was a brother attending from Singapore, and if you know, the majority of Muslims in Singapore follow the shafi'i school, 
And he attended Juma at this Imam's who got this Mufti's masjid. And afterwards, he came up to the Mufti. He said, Mufti, you know, with all due respect, um, could you please have you know mentioned taqwa in the khutbah? Because now I have to repeat my prayer. So it's being conscious of other of other madhab. You know how like when so you guys have all worked with your school to to uh, to facilitate an MSA, right? You know that feeling that you get from your teachers and your administrations when, when they're, when, when, and they might be Christian or they might be Hindu, but they're like, oh yeah, you know, come on, we're going to make, you know that feeling? Yeah. <laughs> Do we have that with each other as Muslims? We're like, oh, you're Shafi, oh, okay, all right, I'm going to, uh, uh, like, no brother, this is what I studied, this is what I know. Do, you know what I'm saying? In our message, do we have the same way that they're treating uh, us? No. They don't. So that's something we have, we have to like, Implement in our massage and like say, oh brother, okay, sorry, you know, uh, difference in dietary understanding, right? Differences in um, uh, in, in, in the Jum'ah and Khutbah, not say, brother, why are you causing division? Brother, the deen is easy. Brother, you know, you're making it too complicated. Brother, you know, this is against common sense. When I was in Mauritania, we lived in a village, and there's about 200 people in the village. We never prayed Jum'ah. And this is like a, they call it a mahbara, it's, it's like a, a desert university that's hundreds of years old. But the majority of they've been living in tents and huts and so forth, but they've been there for hundreds of years. Never prayed Jum'ah. Why? Because according to the Maliki school, which they follow, you actually have to have brick and mortar buildings, and you have to have, or I should say brick and mortar, you have to have buildings that are established. It could be made out of wood, but established. But your 12 people, they have to be residents of that village, that are intending that, like, we're going to make this a city or a town. But the majority of people in the madrasa, that they're there, they're just, like, passing through. I'm going to be here for five years to do heaven. I'm going to be here for ten years to do fiqh. I'm going to be here. You see, you see what I'm saying? So, like, we don't follow according to, the, uh, to our school. So I remember mentioning that there was a person. He said, um, he said oh, so, you know, how was Jum'ah at the school? I said, we never prayed Jum'ah. We just prayed Fulqa. He's like, why not? I said, well, here's the Madhavi school. And he told me, he said, I remember him saying it. He said, so illogical. And I thought to myself, I said, well, you know, you, you come from a country where they're shafani. There has to be 40 people for a shafani jama'ah. And I've heard stories in, in, in Palestine where, where, where the imam would go out and he would count the people. And if they didn't hit 40, they would pray Boba. That's just, that's about. And if somebody wants to follow that, you know, how that? If you feel comfortable with three, how that? If you feel comfortable with 13, how that? Uh, oh, so 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 you can't have this kind of you know food at your you know or what if the the, the teacher or your advisor if they're not Muslim they wanted to have food for you during the day in Ramadan or water can I provide water for you oh no sorry oh, oh okay so having that type of attitude is really what we need you know instead of all of this you know so illogical brother um, so how did I get off on that topic now um, what were we talking about just wrapping it up. Again. What's that? Yeah, so the basics of, uh, oh, so to be, um, what is the word? To be not conscious, but to be sensitive to the differences of opinion that exist within our deen and the various understanding, and to try to accommodate them. So if a person says, look, we're following the majority of the Hanafi school, uh, but, um, we, and so we don't need to follow the, the Shafi points. No, include those in there. So try to have it as an Arabic. So, alhamdulillah, salat was Praying the salawat, taqwa, and then du'a for the believers. And then if you want to have some air, you know, some English uh, put in there, just do dhikr right before you sit down. Uh, because remember, the shafi'is don't need a uh, don't uh, the, the pause does not uh, affect the uh, affect it. And then um, and then here, actually, let me just try, write it up on the board. We're going to say, you're going to have um, hamd, some sort of alhamdulillah, salawat, some sort of form upon the Prophet wasallam, and his companions and the believers and so forth. The more people you include in that, but it can be as little as Allahumma salli wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Salawat, um, um, order to taqwa. Um... An ayah, which is actually a form of a dhikr, but you could also do a dhikr. And then we, we said,
And then we said man should be joined in that one, you know, if you get like an, an ayah of tab, about tabla, right? And then dua for the believers. Now, as far as I know, and if anybody catches something that I'm missing, um, uh, this, you got your chutbah right there. So, hamd, salawat, order to taqwa ayah, they can, you can get this with. So, if somebody says, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, ya ayuhal ladina amu taqullah haqqa tuqatihi wa la tamutunna illa wa 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 tamutunna That's it. Pretty simple, right? Deen is simple. We make it complicated. Um, and then, now, if somebody gives an English talk, this is khutbah one. That's the bare minimum. One. one. The first one. If somebody gives the English talk, we said, now, what has essentially happened here is it's like a pause, because the, the khutbah is in Arabic, has to be delivered in Arabic, and so English is considered, when we look at it through the lens of the sharia, it has to look like you were silent. Because it's not that English is not fulfilling, you know, we can't say, uh, like, you know, we say, we praise Allah and we send pray, peace and prayers upon the Prophet. Allah. That's fine, that's beautiful. But the, the, the khutbah is in Arabic, just like when we pray, book of prayer, would we be like, praise be to Allah, the Lord of the world, right? <laughs> I know people that have done that, that have prayed for months like that. Well, this one brother, he actually became Muslim just by reading books. Um, and so he's like, well, I can't remember. So, okay, praise be to Allah, the Lord of the world. You know, please guide us in the straight. You know, guide us in the straight path, the straight path that you, the, the path that you have bestowed upon, them and so forth. So, if you do the English talk and pause now, and then you're going to do the sitting according to the Shafi'is, you're fine, right? Because you got all their components, and the pause is okay. But what happened for the Hanafis? You got that pause, so what are we going to do? Add in some dhikr before you sit down. Do some sort of dhikr, like add something in there. And I end as I have begun by saying Alhamdulillah, wa salatu salamu ala rasulillah, and I remind you, Ya you had ladina amnu taqullah haqqa tuqatihi. Nobody's going to be like, brother, why did you do that? Um, and so, and then you sit down. Then when you stand up, the second thing, same thing like that, and you're fine. Make sense? So the bare minimum, you just like do the first khutbah and you're just done, right? No, you have to sit and then do the second khutbah. Okay. And then a second khutbah. And then the second khutbah is is just like the first one. It's just like the first one. You have all of those components in there. Does that make sense? You could actually, you know, as your MSA, you could print that up on like a little index card. And, and this actually really helps. Knowing the bare minimums really helps because one of the things that happens in MSA is like, oh, we can't find a speaker, or the speaker can't uh, schedule, uh, canceled, or so forth. Well, everybody in the, or our MSA president who normally does the chutbahs, he's not here today. Well, have multiple people trained in how to do it. And then for the sisters, the reason why it's important for the sisters to know that is not just so that they can um, uh, help in, 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 in writing the English talk, is that they should know the fit of this because for two reasons. One, if they're praying in that jama'ah and the chutbah is not correct, is their prayer correct? So let's go back to this, first of all. When we say jama'ah chutbah, uh, if we establish jama'ah, it's an obligation upon men. Is it an obligation upon women? No. No. But it's a sunnah for them to attend. And if they attend, does it fulfill their obligation to have to pray dhuhr that day? It does, right? They don't have to repeat it. So now, if they're doing Jum'ah instead of dhuhr, should they make sure that this is a valid Jum'ah? Yes. Okay, and so they should know these integral parts of the fiqh of the Jum'ah. So if a brother comes up and he misses some of that, he's like, you know, uh, um, what, if he just, what if he just starts off with like some English praise of Allah? Doesn't do any Arabic dhikr, and that's what I should put here when we say dhikr, it has to be in Arabic. Um, he doesn't do it, and then he starts praying. Sister should speak up and say, brother, you missed some components, integral components of the, of the Jum'ah. That chutbah needs to be re re repeated. Also, she can help in checking and make sure if somebody is going to be trained in as a uh, pinch hitter on the, on the, on the, the chutbah, she can 
be there to make sure, like, do you know these components? Quiz him. You know, be part of the so the MSA. So just have a couple of people who 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 are trained in to know the basic integrals. And if you know this, like, how long can you be? How long could you get a chutzpah and the and the the prayer done in? Ten minutes. And, and that's and that's with time to spare. Right, ten minutes would be with time to spare. So. All right, one quick question, and then we'll just take like a, uh, a 10 minute break. Um, how many people felt that this really clarified to them, like, oh wow, Juma, like now it's, it's clear? It's like, like you're comfortable with wudu, right? Nobody's going to come, come in there and say, like, oh, you're, like, <laughs> uh, you should be as comfortable with the Juma Khutbah as you are with like wudu. Like, I know the basics. So, how many of you would say, like, this has helped you get a, get a good uh, understanding of that? Did you already have this? Yeah. You did? Okay. All right. How about you? Uh, yeah. I just, uh, it's good to know so I can tell others how to do it. Okay. And uh, it cleared up a lot of questions for me as well. Okay. So I, I was like, is this right? Is this person saying something? Let me just follow him. Because okay. Because like, you had heard from multiple people, yeah. right? Yeah. How many uh, have, uh, of the attendees have actually studied the fit of khutbah, either online through their own personal reading or attending a class? You have? Where did you? Uh, um, I studied at Zaytuna. And then okay. I read in the book some Okay, all right, so you are got some familiarity. Okay. All right, so then we'll take a two minute break. I know some people came with already having um, uh, breakfast. There are some breakfast items out there, so feel free to grab some breakfast items that are not a brunch. It's 11.37. We'll come back at about 11.45. That way we can do, we can go for another 45 minutes, which now I'm gonna talk about some of the, um, some of the integral or, or just, uh, uh, advice that I have in terms of delivering um, a talk, the Bayan or the English talk, and then uh, then we'll take a short break and then we'll go into topics that, that, that you should focus on in your book lesson. So now we covered the integrals of the fiqh of the khutbah and what you should be, be covering. You'll notice that one of the, if we said the integrals is just the dhikr, if you focus on the bare minimums of the khutbah, do you really have to give a quote unquote good speech? No. You don't. So it's not about whether or not you are a good speaker. It's just you fulfill the integrals of the, 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 the prayer. And this is really an important uh, point to think about, that a chutbah is not about being a good speech. So think about the prayer, for example. When you go to the masjid, the imam prays. You've all prayed behind people with a good voice, medium voice, and people who could use a little help, right? But at the end of the day, all three of those categories, if they fulfill the integrals of the prayer, is your prayer sound? Yeah. Right? It's sound. So, same thing with adat. You've heard great adats, right? That'll make you cry. Who's ever cried when they heard an adat? It's okay. Raise your hand. Mashallah. It'll make you cry. And other adats are like, oh, that, that's the thick of a lot, please, you know? <laughs> you know? Um, but they fulfill the integral. So, there's a difference between hitting the bare minimum and doing, you know, what's doing things with ihsan, like perfecting them. So, this is important to know in the MSAs because you might have people that shy away from giving khutbahs because they might say, oh, I don't know how to give a good speech. I'm not a good public speaker. Well, you say, well, the, the, let's, as long as we've got somebody to hit the, bare, the intervals for us, it doesn't, the, 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 being a good public speaker is not one of those intervals. Does that make sense? But it's going to make it better. Now, what's going to help you in terms of giving, uh, being a good public speaker? Some people just have a natural talent. They have the ability, you know, they, they're good talkers. Um, and it might be a combination of nature and nurture. The point is they don't need much training. Other people, they may never develop that skill. And some people could develop that skill with a little bit of help. Um, and there's a lot of things, you know, in your, in your uh, college, and you might want to take some public speaking classes, take some, you know, communication classes. I think it's very important 
to be able to uh, to do tabligh of this message, to, to convey this message and to get to convey it in a good way. I mean, I remember um, in, I think my first year of college, I took, or second, yeah, first year at Loney College, I took, um, what was it? Um, it was like a communications 101, but a bit public speaking 101, and I learned a lot. That's actually one of the classes that I remember till this day. Some of the points that they, uh, that they talked about. Um, but a few things that I would say, and this is just from my, over the years, just collecting, you know, in, in my own experience. Uh, there's, there's lessons online, you can look at, you know, YouTube videos, there's TED Talks that talk about public speaking, you know, if you're going to be giving talks in public, just learn about some of the, the art of communication and style. Um, but one of the main things that I would say is that when you get into this position of, like, being literally on the stage, and having the microphone, remember, it's a very powerful thing that could affect your heart. So the first thing is that you want to make sure that this position of giving, delivering khutbas is not done out of kibbit, out of arrogance, and it's not increasing any arrogance. And how is one way that, that this could happen? Uh, <clears throat> one way actually to remember or to think about is remember how in the first section we were talking about the Arabic, the khutbah is in Arabic. Right? All three, all the that have say it's got to be in Arabic. They just differ on what has to be said in Arabic. And so a person might ask the question, well, why does it have to be in Arabic even if they're not Arabic speakers? Why do we read the Quran in Arabic and not read it in the local language? And um, they say that the power of the Quran and the power of dhikr, even though it's in the medium of the Arabic language, it's, it, it penetrates the heart. It goes across um, uh, languages and will go into the hearts of people. I'll give you an example. Um, a, a good friend of mine, Harun Sellers, you know Harun from Zaytuna, right? When he first became Muslim, uh, he didn't know Arabic, um, and he had actually never heard the Quran in Arabic. And one day he was in the masjid, and he heard somebody that were selling cassette tapes of the Quran. This is back in the day when there was still cassette Anybody who's, Who has not seen a cassette tape? You guys have all seen cassette tapes? Oh, you have? Okay, so there's going to be a generation, though, that's going to be like, you know, uh, that's the whole, you know, it's a music. I actually went, has anybody ever been to Niles in Fremont? You know the antique places? I saw toys that I used to play with in the antique shops. I went to a museum in Detroit, and, I, and they, had, they had stuff that I used to play with in the 80s. It's in a museum. I'm like, what is going on here? So, anyway, cassette tapes. So this was when the cassette tape, the Quran was still on cassette tapes. He heard the Quran in Arabic for the first time. He said, what is that? He was drawn to it. He went... The man said, this is the, the Qur'an recitation in Arabic. He bought the whole set. He started listening to it in his car. There was one cassette tape that stood out to him. And he kept listening to it over and over and over again. But he didn't know what it was. Even the name of the surah was written in Arabic. So he went to his friend, who was also a convert, recent convert to Islam, but had been studying Arabic. And he said, what is this surah uh, that's, that's, that's being recited? Now, to give you an idea of Harun, uh, how would you describe Harun if you know him? What are some of the things he's passionate about? Star Wars. Okay, Star Wars. Um, videography. So videography. Uh, he's very generous in heart. Like generous in his heart, yes. Poetry. Poetry. Yeah. Right? Would you say, I'm not, I'm not making, okay. He's, he's always he's thinking like a poet. He's writing poetry. Before he became Muslim, he actually wanted to go into the music industry, and he has a whole story about, about that. But he's really, he, he, he writes poetry all the time, and very heartfelt poetry. Well, what do you think the surah was that he, kept, he was attracted to? Surah Rahman. Yes. Surah al-Shu'ara. Oh. The surah of the poets. He did not know the name of the surah. He did not know what it was talking about. But he had his heart is a poet. He has lots of English poetry. And that was the surah that just struck a chord with him in his heart. So what's going on there? That message is going into his heart, even though he's not able in his aqa, able to understand what's going on, it's hitting his heart. So this is really something to remember, that when you're delivering the chuppah, you're just, you, you need to, you, you're, you're delivering a message, and, and it has to travel from the heart to the heart. So if a person has issues in their heart, it might not penetrate the, the, the ears of the listeners. And there's a saying in Arabic, الْحِكْمَةُ تَدْخُلُ مِنْ حَيْثُ خَرَجَتْ Wisdom will enter the way it goes out. And the way that, we, that, that, that I learned this lesson 
is that there were two students in the Mahdara where I was studying in Mauritania, and they, one, had not, uh, the one had studied Arabic with his Islamic studies teacher, and another had studied Arabic with a professor, but she had really didn't have much care for Islam, but she was teaching Arabic. And so this student who had studied Arabic with, with uh, practicing Muslim scholars as teachers, his Arabic was better. And so this other student asked our teacher, he said, why, why did that happen? I had college level courses and it was more, uh, more advanced and we had more material. He has less material, less structure, no structure, you know, so forth. And he told him, he said, uh, uh, wisdom will come out, will go into the heart the way it comes out. So if the giver of the message is sincere, it's going to go into the hearts with sincerity. Does that make sense? So what it, when you're up there on the stage or up there on the, 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 the area giving the khutbah, you may not deal with this. Some people naturally don't deal with the arrogance that's associated with this stage, but just be conscious that it is a very powerful thing. And there's a term in English, they call it the bully pulpit. Has anybody ever heard that? The bully pulpit. So this is a pulpit. You stand in the minbar, you give him the talk, and, and you have a captive audience. And especially because it's haram to speak during the khutbah. So if I'm up there giving a talk and criticizing people and talking, and I'm looking at the silence of the crowd, and nobody's responding to me, I'm like, okay, I'm going to roll it, and, and, and go through all this uh, you know, criticism of other people and of, of whatever's going on, and forgetting that, um, that now that this is just increasing in my arrogance. So just start from a position of humility, that you want to be in this position to, to give the khutbah with, with sincerity, and that's what you're going to try to, to give it out, uh, to give the message out. One of the ways that you can, that really, that works very well, is that when you're giving the khutbah, speak to yourself first. Remind, remember that. In fact, I'll, I'll write it up on the, the board. Um, this will help you in two things. It will help prevent kibbit, arrogance, from entering into your heart. It'll also make your message that much more powerful. Um, okay, so I'm going to say start with the heart. And just check your heart. Just say, make sure, okay, am I doing this because I want to criticize people, attack people, talk down to people? Um, the other thing is, um, speak to yourself first. Um, so starting with the heart, what's going to benefit is that if you speak to yourself first, it's going to help you protect your heart. So when you see, when you you'll hear Arabic khutbas, they'll say "Usi kum what what Usi nefsi." So even that is a is a I advise you and I advise myself to have taqwa of Allah. So even in the, like this is a long time tra uh, traditionally. It's because the bare minimum, remember the bare minimum, is actually an order to the jama'ah. Ittaqullah. So even if the person doesn't give, uh, give an order to himself as the khatib, the, kh the khutbah is still valid. Does that make sense? But if you just stick to, oh, ittaqullah, ittaqullah, you guys have taqwa, you have taqwa, you, what about you? We, I, the speaker, I need to have a reminder to taqwa. So, usikum wa usinafsi bi taqullah, ittaqullah. So speak to yourself first. So, so watch out for... Um, uh, watch out for, for saying you, or especially you people. You know, don't ever say you people. Um, um, use, use we. And also, this is one of the most important things that I, it's not an iPhone, it's not an iPad, it's the iMessage. Does anybody know the iMessage? Anybody familiar with the iMessage? Yeah, what's the iMessage? Uh, it's like saying, I starting your sentence with I, I can do this, I can do that. Is that mm -hmm. what you mean, or is like, are you talking uh, about that? Well, it's, it's usually, this is usually used in the context of when you're discussing with people, usually about a confrontation. Because if, say, some, say somebody insults you, and you go to them, what would be the first thing that you would want to say? Well, why would you do that? What did you say? Why did you insult me? Why did you insult me? So that's, that's watch out for you. Because what's now, what's the natural response of the person you're going to say most of the time? Think of every time you've been insulted or hurt or somebody annoyed you or hurt your feelings and you said, you annoyed me, you hurt my feelings, you insulted me. What's their first response? Could be anything. What is that? You did it first. Okay, you did it first. What else would they say? I didn't do that. I didn't do that. 
And, uh, and now the next thing, after they say, I didn't do that, what are they going to say? You did do that. Okay, now it's going to get, you did, I didn't, you did, I did. But what if, if they explain, I didn't do that? Nasa, I didn't insult you because, what might they say? Because. Uh, Anybody else? I'm not that type of person. Or I'm not that type of person. That's not what I meant. You misunderstood me, right? So now it's really your word against them. That's when you use the you message. But if you say, I feel you insulted me, can they say, can they say anything about your feelings? So now we're not talking about what they did. We're talking about what you, fe uh, you felt. So that's what, in fact, this is, the person who taught me the I message was a former crip from Los Angeles who spent 28 years in a, in a California state prison for being in a car when somebody else murdered somebody else. Because in California, if you're sent the same car when somebody else commits a crime, everybody in that car gets the same sentence. Everybody. So he had a life sentence. He became Muslim while in prison. But I was talking to him about a conflict that I was having with a person. He said, Rami, are you using the I message? I said, what's that? And so he explained this to me. So thank you, Bahar, if you ever watch this video. Uh, thank you very much. I'll send, him to, I'll send it to him as well. So use the I message. How does that help me in, in, in delivering khutbas or speeches? It's helped me be, now that we're not, this is not a, a conversation we're having with the, the uh, but you might say, you, you, you focus on yourself. Now, you're not going to be talking about your feelings in the FOPA, but it also, it'll help you just remember when you think about I, use I and use we and I. So, I feel, or, you know, I feel like if somebody says, look at the difference between this. This community needs to start practicing the sunnah better. Right? Two problems there. One, it's you people. You people need to start practicing the sunnah. So it's already already making the assumption like, I'm practicing the sunnah. You need to do it. The other thing is like, well, they could say, well, I am practicing the sunnah. Right? So if a person says, I feel that we need to be practicing the sunnah better. Can anybody argue with that? Because couldn't we all use improvement on the sunnah? But as soon as we move it to a definite you, the problem is it's coming, it's, it's very, um, it's very preachy. You ever heard the word preachy? Right? So people, they, human beings will shut down at preachiness. They'll shut down. Um, so you got to, you know, uh, watch out for being preachy. So, I mean, technically, um, uh, technically, we are preaching from the pul pulpit, you know, I'm preaching and so forth, but it's like the, the, the way that it's used right now, people don't like the uh, you know, somebody preach. And what they mean by this is a person that's like, A, feels better than everybody else and is judgmental. So you should, the person should feel like when you step on the chutbah is feel that you're lower than the people. Well, there was one of the, the famous scholars, I believe of Andalusia, Ibn Abi Jama, and he said, <clears throat> He used, to give a, he used to give his lesson. He said he didn't like even being on a, on a stage like this. And he said, if I could, I would rather dig a hole and sit in the hole and give my lessons. Because when the teacher sits on a pedestal, it could be so that people in the back can see them. But it also is very easy for the next to be like, oh, man, I'm better than you. In fact, it gets to the point that if we pray, say we pray Jama'ah in here, and me, the Imam, and a few people, we prayed up here, and you guys prayed down here, it could invalidate our prayer. Does that make sense? We all have to be on the same level. The sisters can be higher. The jama'ah can, the rest of the jama'ah can be higher. But as soon as the imam, and if he has a special, a select group of people around him get higher, it could invalidate the prayer. Because the sharia is very, very, wants to set some limits to be very careful about arrogance creeping in. So you feel, make sure that when you're talking to people that you feel lower than they are. And that's why... Um, when you say, I enjoy myself and I enjoy you. I remind myself and I enjoy, enjoy you. I, I, I remind myself first. And then I re like use a lot of that language so that the, the, the congregation hears that you're, you're being conscious of that and you're reminding your own nefs, your own self, this is not about me. I figured everything out right. I can do everything you know, right. Um, I got everything right. And you're, you're the people that need help. Um, one thing that uh, to, to, to remember about this is remember um, about, let's see, the hadith. I'm just going to say the hadith. Okay.
Okay. The hadith. I'm running out of rooms. Let's say hadith of the the most top. Okay. I have to excuse my handwriting. I'm going to type this up. Okay, so when we pray in a congregation, is the prayer lifted to the heavens according to the taqwa of the imam? What's that? I think it's congregation. I go, uh, uh, who says the, con the congregation? Anybody else have another view? Like when Allah counts this, so the Prophet ﷺ, he encouraged us to go out and find the biggest jama'ah to pray with, like on our daily prayers. And why did he do that? Because that jama'ah, the prayer will be assessed according to the person amongst that jama'ah who has the most taqwa. Right? Is it the imam? No. It could be anybody in the jama'ah. So remember this hadith because as you're, if you're the imam of the prayer, just because you're leading the prayer, Yes, the, you have to know the rules of the imam and make sure your prayer is correct and all that stuff, but this, the reward, the spiritual state of this jama'ah is not contingent on you and your fit of the prayer. Does that make sense? It's somebody out there in the jama'ah, we don't know who it is. So the same thing when you're, when you're speaking to the crowd, remember, you're, you, you might be the person with the most tawa. might be you. It might be somebody in the congregation, but we don't know. In fact, one time I said, can the person with the most tawa stand up here, please? Who's gonna say, if the person who stands up, like, it's not you, right? Uh, so we don't know who that is. So when you're speaking to that, just remember, you're speaking right now to somebody at this moment. Tomorrow it might be somebody different because taqwa levels shift. But you're speaking to the people. You say, like, it might be somebody in the, in the jama'ah. And that will help you, like, keep the, the humility of delivering the khutbah. So this is all about, you know, just, like, speaking to yourself. Um, oh, another thing about speaking to yourself. This is a funny, uh, funny story. There's a comedian I listen to sometimes, and I'll mention. I'll give him free advertising on the MCC's platform. His name is Brian Regan. Has anybody ever heard of him? No. One reason I like him is because you know a lot of comedians they uh, they use vulgarity and foul language and so forth, and it's just like, come on, man, can't you? get to humor without using all of that stuff. So he's one comedian who doesn't use any foul language, doesn't talk about like, you know, doesn't focus on like bathroom humor or sexual humor or whatever it might be. He's just, he's very clean, uh, clean comedian. There's a number of Christian comedians who are very, they're clean in their, in their comedy. So I enjoy listening to him and I find him very hilarious. One time he had an interview where somebody was saying, how do you train as a comedian? And he said, he said, when I'm speaking to my audience, I'm trying to make myself laugh. And it's from him as a comedian, that has been very effective in him like making thousands or millions of people laugh. And he was a, he's actually a very famous uh, comedian. Not as famous as some of the other the big comedians. But it made me think about, uh, about this. Um, and I have been, I remember one time where actually, it was a number of years into giving khutbahs and speeches, I made the conscious decision that when I give the chutbah, I'm speaking to myself. I'm actually speaking to myself. And when I made that, that, that conscious decision, I remember somebody came up to, to me afterwards. He said, wow, this is the most powerful chutbah I've ever heard. But the whole chutbah, I was talking to myself. Like when I was saying, and, and, and but I was saying we. I was saying we, but in my mind, I'm intending like uh, to myself for two reasons. One, when, when you're listening to the chutbah, you're getting one level of benefit. But when you're speaking, you know, you're so focused on delivering the message, you're not necessarily hearing it yourself. So I was, I made a conscious decision to say, no, I'm going to be speaking to the jama'ah, but not only saying, I remind you and I remind myself, because I had been doing that, but now I made a conscious effort to, like, during the whole chutbah, to say, I'm speaking to myself. And then it made, it made a shift. And it's a constant struggle, because it can easily slip into... The message of you people. Um, so this is this is some of the, the advice that I would say um, to help you in delivering your message, um, and so that it is a that it stays within the realm of like being a bad that act of worship, and it's not something that's going to increase arrogance. Anybody have questions so far? Um, let's see where we here. <clears throat> All right.
right, so if you have a phone, you can snap a shot out of this. We're also going to collect emails and, um, or if you're taking notes, if you're, if you're using the old-fashioned method, go ahead and take your notes, finish them up, and we'll clean the board. If you're using the, so I'm going to get it away just for myself. All right. Now, in terms of um, then, in terms of preparation for for the chutzpah. Again, we're not talking about topics right now. We're just talking about delivery. So, for some people, they work really well off of uh, of, of notes. Okay. So, so some people some people work really well with having notes or you know, a PowerPoint, the work out of PowerPoint. Some people do well uh, rehearsing, um, and you can record yourself. There's no one right way to public speaking. Again, look online, there's lots of resources about public speaking. What you should find is what's most comfortable for you. If you feel like, look, I'd like to just have a general topic, and when I get up there, I just start talking, and make it more conversational, and that's more comfortable for you, and that's what's resonating with the congregation, then go with that. If you find more benefit in having notes or a PowerPoint that you're, well, I guess a PowerPoint, well, you can have it on your phone. I, so I have not, I do chutzpah notes on my phone, and just scroll through them. Some of the sessions now are getting fancy and at the minute, but have you seen they actually have the, the iPad stand, like for the khatib? Yeah. So, um, so you can do that. Uh, record yourself. Um, if you're driving in the car, if you're at home, you know, just like, just talk to yourself out loud. Anybody talk to themselves out loud? Yeah, it's okay. I do it all the time. Uh, I grew up hearing my grandfather. He would always be talking. It sounded like he's actually having a conversation with somebody. Walk in. He's talking with the tomatoes or talking with the <laughs> boy. You know, my, he's from Mississippi, so he has like a southern accent. Like, you're nice. You're not cutting that sharp, you know? What's wrong with you? Um, but talking out loud helps too because you, you get used to um, hearing your voice and, and being more comfortable. The main thing that I would say is just focus on being comfortable in delivering the message. As soon as you get like nervous and, and, and tense up, it's going to affect the way you talk. It's going to affect people's you know ability to listen. Just loosen up and think about it like having a conversation. So that's one thing. Like um, use a conversational style. Um, This will help in, especially in MSAs and high schools. Maybe in a, like a community, you might want to you want might want to keep it a little bit more official because you have people from all uh, levels. But if you're at if you're at the uh, high school or a college MSA, the, uh, probably lean more towards conversational. Then you're not giving a speech to your history class. You're not giving a, a speech, you know, in front of public speaking. You're trying to deliver a message to to the congregation. So consider it like a conversational um, conversational style. Um, the only thing, just watch out if you if you use this method, uh, watch out for getting too for getting too um, what's the word like uh, too laid back because it's not a conversation, right? You are trying to deliver a message. In a religious uh, uh, like platform, and so you have to respect this the stage, so to speak. You might be at the same uh, level of the people, but you have to uh, respect the member. So respect the member. You have the audience is captive; um, they're not talking. Especially if you're in the actual football, it's haram for them to talk. So even if they wanted to voice, like you know, hey, I don't, I don't uh, agree with that, they're not able to. So don't make it to where it's like too conversational and you might uh, slip into being a little bit too unofficial and now you're throwing in jokes. Uh, don't use jokes in, the, in a chutzpah. Um, don't use, uh, I mean, sometimes people might say things that like, is like humorous, but don't try to make the congregation laugh. You know, remember this is a, it's a, remember that this is a, a, a okay? Um, 
This is the point of the chutzpah. Now, if you're using a bayan style or the English talk, but the morila, what's a good translation for morila? Reminder? Or it's more than a reminder. A thicket is a reminder. A morila is like, um, it's not a stern talk. Wild is like, it's a um, speech. It's a speech, but it's a speech that, think of like, okay, in the chutzpah, uh, we're not having a, uh, a it's not a feel-good talk, right? You go to a fundraising dinner, you go to some active, you know, it's like, it's not a, it's not a feel-good talk. It's, re, it's a talk that will like, it's, it's, getting, it's reminding people, and it's like a deep reminder. Informative. What's that? Informative. More than, because informative would be more like a lesson. Like what I'm doing here, right? We're going through the nuts and bolts of the of the chutzpah. So you got informative, and then over here you got a feel good talk. This is more of like a deep reminder, okay? A deep, let's call it a deep, somber reminder. The mo'ada is in Arabic, right? Mo'ada is is no mo'ada is just that's the purpose of the chutzpah. So if you're going to um, the whole purpose of the chutzpah, you know, it's not a rally like. Okay, we all need to give sadaqah to this place over here. Like, so I'll give you an example. When, when people tell me, deep, somber reminder. When they come up, and I'll write these down. When they come up and they, and this leads into uh, our next section, which is talking about what subjects should we talk about in the khutbah. <clears throat> is that, uh, I'll give you an example. One time I was in Canada, and the masjid said, so it was a huge congregation. They say, we run this masjid based on the Friday donations. And we asked the chutbahs to tell people, please donate to the sadaqah boxes. Well, that's a call for sadaqah. That's not what the Jum'ah chutbah is about. And I have a strict policy, even if it's my own fundraiser for my own organization, I will not use the chutbah to tell people, and there's a fundraiser this Saturday night, that's not what the chutbah is about. You want to make that announcement after the chutbah, before the chutbah, that's fine. The chutbah is like, it's like prayer. Four rak'ahs of bohor become two rak'ahs plus two rak'ahs of chutbah. So it's like the prayer. So that's why there's integral parts that we have to hit. But if we're going to extend the speech part of the chutbah, we have to keep it within the realm of a mo'ila. If it goes into a political discussion, if people start talking about politics, you can actually start talking with your neighbor. So what are you going to do today after Jum'ah? Like it's no longer how, because he's left... Talk, he's left the, the subject of the of the of the chutbah. It has to be a mo'ila, which is a deep, somber reminder. So it's not a feel good talk. I mean, a person may mention stories that make a person feel good, but it's not uh, it's not to be too conversational to where it's like, oh yeah, yeah, just chatting. <laughs> no, it's to make people think, like a deep think. Like um, you go to the chutbah, you hear something, you're like, okay, how can I apply this to my life? So don't talk about, and that we can get into the to the next one. So this is just some advice that I have. Oh, on the previous ones, uh, some more technical stuff. Um, but the main thing is, remember that this is a deep, somber reminder. So now we can go into the section of um, topics, to what to choose to talk about and what not to choose to talk about. But before I go into that section, does anybody have any, any questions? Yes? I've heard some scholars, they're trying to push for budgets to like start using PowerPoints. Um, in the book? Oh, wow. Is that, is that problematic or... Um, Again, pushing for PowerPoints, you know, to use in the chutbah. I think, I think it would be problematic because it goes more towards like a ta'lim, like an informational, uh, uh, you know. The chutbah is not, people are going to learn in the chutbah. There's no doubt. You learn, you pick up more points. But that's not the point of the chutbah. The point of the chutbah is a ma'orim, is a reminder. Um, and if we go to the PowerPoint, you know, uh, section now, it's like, okay, brothers, now, if you turn your attention to slide number two, you know, it's like, that's not, uh, think of the difference between, actually, even think of the difference you're feeling right now, because this is essentially like a PowerPoint, right? I could have done this on a PowerPoint. Think of your feeling right now, as opposed to when you're out there in the gym. Does it feel different? Right? It does. Even the way you're sitting, your attention, your, you know, every, it's different. You go into a different mode. So when, you, when the congregants are coming into that mode, you really have to respect that. So that's why when I start hearing people talk about politics, I'm like, that's not what I came here for, brother. You know, if I want to hear political commentary, I'll go online. That's not what I came. I want. So this is another thing. Uh, so it's not it's not a dining session. One thing that I also learned myself over the years is when I first came back from from studies overseas. You know what I used to make my my chutbas? 
fifth lessons. And that you'll notice that when people first come back from their studies, um, they'll like one brother actually complained to me, he said he went to a masjid, and the whole khutbah was a lesson on istinja. Which are there people that don't know the rules? You can go right to this bathroom and see that. There are foul and nasty people that just, or I should say foul and nasty people, stuff for a lot of that. There are people who come to the masjid and they go to the restrooms and it's just foul and nasty. Sometimes, especially after Jum'ah, it looks like a truck stop on Interstate 5 on the way to LA, right? It's like, are you guys Muslim? Purity is half a faith? What happened to that? You know, uh, 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 one of the first revelations to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa What? Stand and remind the people. What? What the Abakah It was because the Arabs used to drag their clothes. Imagine you if if I go into the restroom and my pants are all the way down like this, what's gonna happen to my pants? So what the Abakah it actually means raise your pants up so that you don't get them get them dirty because when you're walking in the pathways there's there's filth, when you go to the restroom there's filth. So keep your clothes clean. Well, you know, you can see it in our restrooms. It's right, brother. Yeah. It's like people really need to like learn cleanliness. It's half a faith. It's one of the first lessons. Anyway, I don't want to get into a rant, but the chutbah shouldn't be a technical discussion on the rules of istinja. Do Muslims need to learn that? Yes, but the chutbah is a mawila. Uh, now, some people could say it falls into the category of a mawila because of. What the abaqa fatah? Let me just take a quick, and you can disagree with me if you if you want to. But do you think a khutbah is a place to, to discuss the fiqh of istinja? No. And please, anybody who disagree, I just want to make sure I'm checking my. Anybody disagree with me? Because I would love to actually hear disagree. I think it can be a reminder to remind people to learn to learn that right, but to not use that, you know, to to use that. Okay, so um, that's just my, and definitely not politics. It's not a political. Um, a, a stage for political commentary and so forth. Yes, I actually wanted to ask about that as well because um, there's a big push like khutbahs should be relevant and should connect with their audiences. So I was wondering to what extent someone can use what's going on in the world or a political to, and, and draw a lesson from it or something. Okay, like and, and I'm not. Uh, I'm actually pulling up something, some advice. Uh, Sheikh Tamim Ahmadi heard, heard that I was doing this. And he sent me some advice uh, specifically on this, and I really liked it. I'm just going to try to pull it up, um, <clears throat> and we can go into uh, into that because I think even um, content is more important than delivery style. So this is all about like delivery. Take your, you'll be fine if you have a good mo'ewa, but you have a poor delivery. It'll be more important to people that have a great delivery and a poor mo'ewa. Does that make sense? And it's just like, sometimes, who's ever been in a situation where you go into like a butcher shop or you an auntie catches you in the hallway and, and, and just tells you some advice or um, a person passing in the street or you get into the taxi cab, you know, and most of the time this is in Muslim countries where people are having discussions about the deen. And that taxi cab driver or that butcher or that person in passing gives you a reminder that you remember till this day. Right? Everybody had that experience or similar experience. So the mo'ila, it doesn't it doesn't have to be all fancy and nice delivery, which I think the the whole PowerPoint thing takes it away. It's like if we're going back to the idea of starting with the heart. If it's heart to heart, my heart to your heart. Well, this is kind of like it's, it's a little bit shifting in a way. Um, yeah, I think that I, I wouldn't I wouldn't agree with with, with that. Uh, but now we can go. Is, is there any questions about the Delivery, which this is, this is the, the other thing to remember about this, about delivery, this brings up a really good point. Um, if you study the deen and you deliver khutbahs, does that make you a great public speaker? No. So you can learn delivery style from like a TED Talk, from your, your teacher at, at a public speaking class on campus. Like this is more strategy of how we implement it the actual delivery. Can they come to us and tell them, maybe they can give us a little insight on how you reach people and have a reminder again, but can they teach us the fit of, of chutbah? No. We got our structure, but some of these other things, the strategies of how to speak, you can learn from other people. You might have at your MSA, who's, have, who's had non-Muslim students come to the MSA? Yeah, right? Most of the time. And sometimes your advisor, who has an advisor at their MSA that's not Muslim? 
Okay. And does your advisor come to listen to the talks? She's in the room. She's you. in the room. Yeah. Okay. So a couple of things, which also brings in the topic of the reminder. Two things that you can get feedback from them, like how is this message being received, and they might be able to give you some delivery uh, pointers or so forth. The other thing is now that we talk, now we're going to move into to subject. Remember, you're not talking to uh, to people who uh, agree with every single thing that you say. They may not even be Muslim. There's people, there's one brother that comes to the, the, the khutbah here regularly at MCC. He's not Muslim. You guys know that brother? He, he's a yeah. Catholic... Uh, Dennis. Yeah, he yeah. comes every time. He's actually one of the very, like, the first or second row. Every, almost every single week. Every Friday. Every Friday. So you have to make the assumption that there are people who are, A, they're not Muslim in the crowd. Maybe they just want to learn about uh, Muslims or, oh, what's this, you know, I just want to learn a little bit about your, your faith. Um, you also don't want, uh, they, they may or may not even be interested in Islam. But you have to be very careful that whatever you say might offend somebody. So what are some ways to not offend somebody? That's where we're going to say, how do we keep it as a deep reminder to everybody that can benefit everybody in the crowd and not offend people? You're always going to offend somebody. Um, and I have a joke, I say, I have people come up to me after khutbahs, and if they, if they say, oh, great khutbah. They start off with that. You know what the next thing is? But. but. <laughs> and uh, my father is, 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 is Arab. I was raised part of my life in Jordan, so I have an understanding of, our, uh, of Arabs uh, to a certain extent. 90% of the people who do that are Arabs. And the other 10%, this is not, not research-based. It's just anecdotal. The other 10%, they might be non-Arabs, but they live in an Arab country <laughs> at some point in their life. And so they are the people who will be like bold enough to say, I, I have some criticism of your football. One brother actually, he asked me, uh, he came up and he said, you know, you mentioned the hadith and I looked it up. I said, were you doing that during the football? <laughs> were you doing your hadith research during the football? Uh, so we can have another lesson on that on like masjid politics. But at your MSA, you're not going to have as much politics as in the masjid. So, so now let's go into uh, topics. The first thing, stay away from politics. And this is actually mentioned even in the old books of Fiqh. They say, Umur siyasiyah, don't get into politics. That's not, that's not the place of the khutbah. Let's take, for example, the whole Kavanaugh scandal recently. Is it a matter that's debatable? Are people going to debate both sides? Right? Would Muslims debate both sides or maybe say, look, I can see this side, I can see that side? Just a quick yes or no. Like, is it, is it a clear cut? Like, if I said, uh, if I gave a khutbah on khamar being haram and we shouldn't drink khamar, is there any debate about that? No. Do we have Muslims who have addiction issues in our community? Yes. That's a clear cut issue. That's a good somber reminder. Look, we need to deal with addiction in our community. If I start talking about Brett Kavanaugh, and whether or not he should be appointed to the, to the, to the Supreme Court. Is that a clear-cut issue? It's not. And so, and it's not, that's not the place of, that's not the place of the chutbah. Remember, it's a ma'orim. Your, 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 uh, your question earlier, Yusuf, was about making it relevant. And this is what Sheikh Sh Sh Tamim, he mentioned to me to, to give advice. He said, if a person wants to talk about a, a, a political situation that is very relevant, it should be like a senior scholar who has experience in being able to analyze it and, and get to the core of the issue. I'll give you an example. When the Supreme Court made the decision of same-sex marriages, now for us as Muslims, is that a clear-cut matter? We don't have that in our religion, and we're not afraid to say it. And if people want to say that's homophobic, I mean, that's, that's now you're, you're, you're being xenophobic by not allowing me my fundamental rights as an American to have freedom of religion. Look, I'm not going to hurt anybody. And I can deal with a person on a business level. I can have a personal relationship that has that lifestyle. But if you ask me to morally accept that, I'll say this is an authoritarian system. I don't have to accept it. So part of our religion, we don't accept that. When the Supreme Court decision came down, one church that, the Mormon church, that is very, um, uh, very, uh, they have a very structured system, they sent out to all of their churches what the Sunday the khutbah was going to be about. And it was the church's response to how we view that. Well, I took that as a position just to remind 
Look, as Muslims, even though the law of the land is this, and that's what that, that came down, as Muslims, our moral position is this. It's a clear-cut issue, but I'm not going to get into all of the details of, like, should we show up at a rally? Should we be on a petition? You know, should we... All of some of those, like, strategy-type issues. But the moral issue, and if you're able to, like, separate between the two, we can talk about that. So if somebody wanted to talk about the Brett Kavanaugh issue, well, let's talk about sexual abuse in our communities. Let's talk about people abusing positions of power. Like, get to figure out what's that core issue, separate it from the national political schedule, and just discuss that. Somebody might come up after the book and say, oh, you were talking about the Kavanaugh scandal, right? Say, no, I was talking about core universal issues because everybody agrees women should not be assaulted, right? There's nothing a woman can do that would uh, justify an assault. Oh, she was using drugs. Oh, she was using alcohol. Oh, the way she was dressed. Blah, 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 blah. We can address those issues, but we shouldn't go into the political scandal. So I think if a person is able to do that, but that actually, and that's why I appreciated the, the advice from Chef Tamim, is that it takes a senior level of, or, or even if somebody's maybe intro or junior to delivering chutbas, seek advice from a, from a senior level scholar. How can I bring this topic up? Especially at a college MSA, people want to discuss those things. But what I would say is that if you stick with, just stick with, stick with the basics. Stick with the basics. You go to, uh, you know, um, basics of like, uh, what I mean by basics is, well, actually, let me just ask you, what are some basics that we can all agree on? All Muslims, regardless of our understanding of, you know, medheb, no medheb, you know, even maybe even some like Shia Sunni differences or, you know, what are some basics that we can all agree on as Muslims? And then even people outside of Islam can agree with us. What's that? Five pillars. five pillars, right? Like we're going to talk about the importance of the five pillars in our life. What's another example? Turning back to Allah. What's that? Turning back to Allah. Turning back to Allah, right? That's a turning back to your creator. Uh, even a non-Muslim, if they, if they listen to that, like, yeah, I need to turn back to God, you know. Uh, what's it, something else? Turning back to Allah. Hmm? Taqwa. Taqwa, right? Having taqwa. We're not going to get into the detailed set of like, oh, you should avoid this because it's haram according to this uh, scholar. And that's a form of taqwa. But in terms of taqwa as a general principle, hey, that's a great topic. Topic. What is taqwa? You know, what are the hadith about taqwa? And since the main mo'ibah, uh, at least according, we discussed that earlier, according to the Shafi'is, what did the Shafi'is say is the integral part of the khutbah? It taqwa An order for taqwa. So that's like, for them, that was the, the core of the, of the mo'ibah. What's another topic? The life of the Prophet. So. The life of the Prophet. Sina. Um, talking about you know how he dealt dealt with difficulties or hardship, and the seva is actually a great one. So so I was so we said you know five pillars, and that right there you can deal with so many things. You can talk. You can have a whole series of football to shahada. What does the shahada mean? Why do we say shahada? Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, and I don't say ukminu an la ilaha illallah. Right? We become Muslim by saying I bear witness there is no god by Allah. I don't say I believe, even though we believe in Allah. Talking about the shahada, talking about how the shahada can help our lives. Five pillars, that can be a whole year's worth of, what's another, uh, somebody said taqwa, right? Um, what are you saying? Turning, back. turning to Allah, right? Turning to Allah. What else? The youth. What about the youth? That's a good one, the youth. But what exactly about the youth? Uh, they're uh, not, um, they're not, they're turning in their religion. Okay, so turn back to Allah. But another one, youth, you can talk about, you know, you can talk about identity. Not being afraid of their religion. Yeah, so that, which goes into identity, self-esteem, which goes back to the five pillars, which goes back to shahada. Like you can say identity. Um, tawheed. Tawheed, which comes under the five pillars, right? The tawheed is, a, is, a, is a, the importance of tawheed, which also ties into our identity. What makes us Muslim? Or the, 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 the five pillars. Are you afraid to pray in public? Let me ask you guys this that are in high school and colleges. Do you know people that will only pray like at home or in the masjid or maybe in the fitting room of Macy's where nobody can see them? Do you know people like that? <laughs> you can have a whole series on like, hey, brothers, sisters, let's pray in public. You know, and break down like, why are we afraid to pray in public? Uh, if other people are not afraid, if they're not ashamed of, 
uh, shown their lifestyle in public, um, why should we be uh, uh, ashamed of praying, praying in public? Now, if you say, if you, if you, if you give a talk on the importance of praying in public and some of the difficulties that a person might, might deal with in praying in public, and maybe even some strategies on how to you know, pray in public, um, if a non-Muslim was there or somebody newly practicing their, their religion, they're going to benefit. So keep those two, like somebody that's far from Islam but is kind of like coming in the door. You don't want to turn somebody uh, uh, away. But there's some. What are some other just general topics? Yes? Uh, rahma. Rahma, having mercy. The only thing that I would say is when we talk about Rahma, keep it as general as possible. This will do two things. When you keep it as general as possible, you allow the message to get to everybody, and then they can interpret it on how that they need to do it in their life. That's the mawqidma. But if you if you if you tell people we should have rahma and this is how you need to do it, what's happening there, right? If you look at the one of the speaking styles, and this is also as part of your khutbah training, read the khutbahs of the Prophet. See how he spoke to the people. And one of the main ways that he spoke to people is that he would say, Mabada Aqwam. Who's heard of some of these hadith? Right? He would when he's giving a public he would hear about a problem in society, right? Because that's what we're like, okay, problem in society. People are not feeling uh, strong enough to show their Muslim in public. We need a khutbah on identity. The Prophet would hear about issues in society. So we do keep it basic, but we need to keep it relevant. So let's say we stick with ba basics. But make sure that it's relevant. I always have problems spelling that word. There's no spell checker on this board. Is that right? All right. Um, there's a couple words that I always struggle with. Scissors. Uh, conscientious. Anyway. I'm, now I'm opening up a little bit too much. Um, okay. So keep it to the basics and keep it relevant. Uh, the Prophet said, if he heard about a problem, he would say, What do people... Consider, I'll give you an example. There was a group of people, they're the Ash'ariyim. There was a, a, a sub-tribe of the Arabs, they were called the Ash'ariyim. There's a famous Sahaba, Abu, Abu Musa al-Ash'ari. You've heard that name? He came from this group, the Ash'ariyim. Well, they were known to be a very scholarly tribe. When they became Muslims, they clung to the Prophet and the Sahaba, and they learned this deen really well. They were on the outskirts of Medina, and next to them, in another encampment or uh, part of the village was a group of people who didn't know much about the deen. So imagine, you have a scholarly tribe and a person who's new to Islam, but they don't have much. They came, the scholar, the, the, the people who needed more knowledge, they came to uh, uh, complain to the Prophet. They said, our neighbors, the Ash'ariyin, are not teaching us. Because you can imagine a person who's ever had an experience, they might go up to a teacher and say, hey, I'd like to study with you. Sorry, I don't have time. Right? Might be a college professor, I don't have time to take on another mentee. Might be a sheikh, might be a ustada, whoever might, might be sheikh, sheikha, um, don't have time. So they complained that the Ash'ariyin were not giving them enough time. The people who wanted to study complained to the Prophet. Well, he now gives a public address. He said, Mabada Aqwam. That's how he started. What do you say about a people who have knowledge and do not teach their neighbors? Now, one of the things that it did is it can see, everybody else is like, yeah, that's, that's not a good thing. Okay, let's you know, go on with our day. The Ash'ariyin were like, he's talking about us. We need to make a change. So it did something, and they mentioned this. They said the, the, the part of the, the hikmah of the, the Prophet وسلم, he would encourage people in a way that they make the decision to make the change themselves. And it's more powerful than he says, hey, you guys, the Ash'ariyin, you guys need to teach your neighbors, which is an order, as opposed to posing a question. What would you say about a people who have knowledge and don't teach their neighbors. It also allows the person to analyze it without it being directed at them. So the Ash'ariyin are sitting there, they're like, yeah, yeah, that's not a, that's not a good situation. Wait, wait a minute. I do that. Okay, I need to change that. So they went, and they started teaching their neighbors, and then they came to the Prophet, they said, uh, well, actually, before that, I believe, they, they actually said, okay, we know we have that issue, we're going to change it. And they made, a, they made a change. So think about that story. When you're... When you're discussing, okay, the reason I, I kind of sidetracked, but about Rahmah. So if we're talking about Rahmah, we're going to talk about it in a general sense. We need to have Rahmah. We should have Rahmah. It's a part of our deen. Allah, is one of his name is Rahman, Rahim. You know, Rahmah, Rahmah, uh, the Prophet is Rahmatan al That's a general message that everybody can understand. 
But now if we change it to a very specific, go from the general to a specific and say, we should all have rahmah, and so for that reason, you shouldn't do this, this, and this. Don't do that in the football. I'll give you an example. One time there was a, um, there was a person who, she was not, I did not feel that she was fit to um, take, have the care of younger children. I felt she had some, she, and, and it turned out she did, she had a lot of issues that she was dealing with. So, so what happened was the, um, she actually had the care of some children. Long story short, she put the bottle, she wanted to heat up the bottle for the child and she put it in the microwave. Anybody with children knows, never put a bottle in the microwave. You guys probably don't. Like, what's the big deal, right? Because what's going to happen? You know, you know, when you put stuff in the microwave, you know how it like gets unevenly heated? It'll be like cold at the top and you're like, oh, this is still cold. Whoa! Right? And burn, it burns on the bottom. So there's an uneven heat. She had heated up the milk until the bottle melted. And she was about to give it to the child. Luckily, the father just happened to walk back in and stop that from happening. So my question when I heard about that, I said, who referred her to that position? They said, so-so. I said, you know, the person who referred knows about that sister's struggle and that she shouldn't be in that position. She can do other things in this society, but not, not that. And so one of the responses was, well, we have to have rahmah with people and give people a chance. Now, do we have to have rahmah? Yes. Do we have to have rahmah with people? Yes. Do we have to put a person in a position that doesn't require that because of rahmah? No. So keep it general and don't go into the specifics. Or another example, again, another person struggling with a serious issue, and I, um, I uh, spoke to the person's family and I said, you know what, your family member needs uh, uh, needs a lot of um, uh, needs a lot of help. There was they were actually going to put themselves in, in, in a dangerous position. Well. A friend of that person was, was furious that I had spoken to the family. And I said, well, why? This person needs the help and support of their family. They should know they're struggling with this situation. You need to have rahmah. So it's like going from the general, do we need to have rahmah, to the very specifics of in this situation of A, B, and C, you need to do this because of the principle of rahmah. You see what's happening there? So, so try to stay away from... Uh, remember when I said when I first came back I like did a lot of fifth ruling khutbas and I learned the, the hard way stay away from fifth ruling if you try to take a general principle and apply it to a specific situation are you doing a fifth ruling that's essentially a fifth ruling because you're saying you shouldn't say this because of rahma so stay away from that and stick to the stick to the general like the general principles any questions so far um some other some other basics. What would we say? You know, one of the good one. You know, have you ever seen the, the hadith collections that, like, the prophet might say, "These are the rights of a Muslim over the brother." And there's like six, right? Or these are the seven people that will be um, on the day of the day of judgment, shaded on the day of judgment. Or these are the rights of um, these are the rights of the neighbors. Or these are the rights of the streets. You know, you know the rights of the pathway. You familiar with that hadith? And there's like a listed out. One of the things that, and I learned this in, in public speaking early on, they said, you know, one of the most powerful things is to give people numbers. Like today I'm going to talk about the about about three points. Um, today I'm going to talk about four points. And if you look at a lot of hadith, the Prophet ﷺ, when he mentioned things, he's listing them out, and you could easily, that's an easy like a PowerPoint presentation. Rights of the brother, dot, 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 dot. Rights of the street, you know, here's the points. And so if you use those of the chutbah, it's pretty general. Here's the rights of the streets. This is what the Prophet ﷺ said. Maybe give a little commentary in terms of how to apply that in, in our um, uh, situation, in our modern context. And, but just keep stick, stick with the basics. But that's the, the hadith literature has a lot of material. You would probably, like, I mean, uh, for example, there's, uh, I would say, also akhlaq which is very general. And there's websites that will list out hadith. There's one website, I can share this if you, it's like a, a 100 character traits. 50 good, 50 bad. I mean, that's right there. There's a couple years of chutbah, right? Just each week, we're going to talk about one good trait, the next week, one bad trait, you know? And there's an ayah that talks about it, maybe. There's a hadith that talks about it. And just keep it uh, general. Um, um, another one, diseases of the heart. They are mentioned in the Quran, Kibir, Ujub, you know, they're all mentioned in the Quran. 
Somebody said earlier, Sita. I think this one is really, 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 really good. Because when you stick, when you talk about Sita, another point is, okay, the numbers is a powerful point in terms of, uh, of making it, uh, making people remember the topic. Because how many times have you come out of a chuppah and you're like, great chuppah, oh man, you should have listened to it. What are you talking about? Um, uh, come on, who's it done? Who's, that's happened to me, right? Yeah. So you want like some memory pegs to like remember. If two powerful things are the numbers, and one that's even more powerful, stories. How many times have you been in a talk and like, let me tell you a story, and all of a sudden you're like, you know, human beings by our nature, we're in love with, Allah has programmed us to love stories. And what is the best stories? They're in the Quran. Ahsan al Qasas, right? The best of stories. For those of you who speak uh, or understand Arabic, you know when you're reading Quran, you get to Surah Yusuf, doesn't it change a little bit? Right? And especially because the story is like, it's not like the story of Musa that it's in different places. It's like, the whole story is right there. Don't you agree? Like, when you get there and you're like, to, I'm, that's my, my experience. So the stories are very powerful. The story of the Prophet wasallam. that's plenty of khutbah material. Another thing that the stories do is that it, it, uh, they work, that they help in people remembering it, but it really focuses on love of the Prophet wasallam. Love of the prophet or the prophets. Because how can you love a person that you don't know? Talk about that. You know, the reason why people fall in love with, with uh, celebrities and musicians and idols and so forth, what do they do in all of their magazines and their Instagram? Oh, did you know that so-and-so likes to eat Skittles that have been put in an ice cream, right? They like to know all those details. And knowing all of those details about the person you love increases your love for them. So this, the nice thing about keeping it basic, is who can argue with love of the prophets of Allah? Right? And that love of the prophets and the prophet at the, at the head is such a powerful thing that, that everybody needs. And you can, you, everybody can relate to that. Because to love the prophets of Allah, do you need to pray five times a day? Could you drink alcohol and love the prophet? Being honest. Yes. Sure. You could. And there was a Sahaba who used to drink alcohol, and after he was mourned multiple times and then even punished by the Prophet, when people talked about him and started, you know, uh, you know, what did the Prophet say about him? He loves Allah and his messengers stop talking about him. So now, it's not complete love until you love the Prophet and you follow everything that he says. Like Abu Bakr, like Omar, like Ali, like Uthman. That's like the highest of love. But that Sahabi who was still a grand human being, a grand Sahabi, he had love of the Prophet ﷺ in his heart. How many of you have met somebody, and usually you find that, even here, Muslims, somebody, he may not pray. He's bad with he bad in his interactions with other people. With, but when you talk about the Prophet, he just changes. Right? That happens. You can find people that, uh, there was a, uh, well, I was not going to, there's a, there's, this is a powerful thing, like love of the Prophet ﷺ. But keep it general and don't go too specific. If you love the Prophet, then you need to be praying five times a day. Yes, you, that's true. But don't make it to where it's conditional that uh, it's presented in a way that the person comes out and says, Oh, I don't pray, so therefore I don't love the Prophet. Be sensitive to allow everybody there to have some, some connection to that message. You want everybody in the group to say, you know what, I, I, I see where I have Rahmah, and I see where I need to increase. I see where I have love of the Prophet, and I see where I need to increase. But if you make it to where everybody feels like, oh, I don't have any love or any um, uh, Rahmah. Um, so that right there is like years of, um, of khutbah material in general. I'm going to go to some of like the, the, the specific context stuff. What is um, that website that you are talking about? Uh, it's in Arabic. It's called. Uh, what is it called? I'll have to find it. It's it's all in Arabic. I was actually saying you know, a good translation of it would uh, would be would be very very good. Um, I have to find. We'll we'll get it. We'll pass a sheet around here at the end. If everybody wants to put their um, their their email address, we can email the link to this video of the entire training and then whatever resources that I talked about. Some of these notes that I'm going to also take a picture of. Um, but any questions of of this so far? And then we'll end on just some like current events, relevant 
topics kind of a thing. Yeah. Um, so something that I think about sometimes is um, if you're telling a story or relating a hadith that everyone has heard before, mm -hmm. people might like not be too happy about that or they might they might prefer other things. So is there a way or any strategy that you would recommend of how to go about telling a story that maybe everyone's heard before, but doing it in a way that everyone can appreciate? Oh, well, well that's a good question. So the question is, what if you were to present a, um, present a, a hadith that you, um, that everybody's familiar with, but you want uh, to, to keep their, to keep them engaged? That's a really good question. I would say that the, um, uh, a couple of things. The first thing is don't make the assumption that everybody has heard that. Um, so go ahead and mention it because you're more, more often than not, you're going to have somebody who has not heard that. Um, it's just like there's a, there's a, a saying, uh, somebody told me like in marketing, people were saying, okay, if everybody has a phone, why are you doing so much marketing to buy a phone, buy a phone, buy a phone? And so the person responded by saying, every single day somebody turns 18. So maybe yesterday this marketing wasn't relevant to him or her because he couldn't buy his own phone. But today there's a whole new group of people who are turning 18. They need to hear this message. So, and they're giving the same message over and over and over again. So when we come to the Maurila and the reminders and the lessons, you're going to have somebody who their development is not at the same level as everybody else. So you're most probably going to have somebody who hasn't heard that. But... If you have a hadith that's really well known, one of the, that's a good question. How do you make it engaging and relevant to the people? And that's really more of a strategy issue and a storytelling issue. And this is something you can, you can you know, there's lots of online resources of how to tell a story um, and how to, to really make it engaging to people. Um, uh, with also making sure, um, so one thing, uh, just be careful. Well, I don't have to write this right now, but when you're telling stories, just be careful of the the problem of adding in things by conjecture, assumptions. And this was early on when the when the whole field of Maoriba was being developed in the Muslim uh, world, and people were becoming famous for giving these very powerful reminders. Sometimes it would be what they said is a qasas, a storyteller. And one of the, the things that the Qasasin would do is they might tell a hadith, uh, but there's gaps in it. So like say you read, um, you read a story of the Sira of the Prophets or the Sira of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Or you tell a story, especially if you tell children these stories, for any of the parents here, when you've told your child a Sira story, have they asked you questions that, that's not in the Sira? They're like, but what was that person's name or? Where, where did they live or what did their house look? Who's had that like experience where the kid asks a bunch of questions, right? So they're poking holes like there's some gaps here. And so what the Qasasin would do is they would fill in those gaps with like, well, most probably it would be like this or most probably it would be like that. Um, I recently heard there was a, a, a speaker. He was talking about how modern day Arabs conceptualize uh, what Arabs look like and how they spoke. If you speak to most Arabs today, the way they imagine, the way Arabs dressed, and the way they spoke, where does it come from? Hmm? Egyptian movies. Egyptian movies. Or the Moroccan movies now. Or, you know, and so they, they have this assumption that an Arab, like, you know, they wear like a specific thobe all the way to their feet, which the Arabs did not wear. Like, if you look at the literature, they wore... Um, like the lungis, you know, the, 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 the izads, and they wore shirts. But they didn't, they're, they're more like kilts. Like they wore kilts like the Scottish. And you know how the Scots also have like, you know, the thing that wrap around their, their shoulders? That's what the Arabs wore. They wore midat and kilts. But they didn't wear those. And um, you would think that all of them, have, you know, so there's all of these different like concepts that a person has. In fact, one time, um, this one person was saying, these two people were talking, and he said, he said, yeah, you know what, you shouldn't, you shouldn't have a very long beard. He said, why? He said, because that's what the Munafiqin and the Jews used to have. He said, how do you, how, how did you know that? He said, well, look in the movies. And if you look at the movies, they always portray 
the Jews of Medina and the Munafiqeen of Medina as people with very long beards. And so he's like, that's how he was like. So they're not going back to the original sources. So the reason I'm mentioning that is that sometimes a person may want to embellish the stories. Be careful with that because when you tell a story from the Sirah or the Hadith, you're narrating. It's the Hiwaya. And you have to narrate it as is. Now you might say, well, it could have been this, but just try to uh, stick to it as best as possible. But one of the ways that you can do is um, relate it to a modern day story, or um, if you if you sometimes a story embedded within a story helps out. So if you um, if you like, I'll give you an example. Um, we heard the Prophet Sallallahu we know the Prophet Sallallahu what are some of the foods the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam liked from amongst the vegetables on there right now? What's one food that he liked? I don't know, dates, milk. Dates, dates what is a fruit? Dates are fruit, but from the vegetables. Oh, vegetables. Vegetables. Lettuce? I don't know. Okay, well, there's your chuppah topics, man. <laughs> shama'il. Get the shama'il of Timothy, and there you got a couple years worth of chuppahs right there. Okay. <laughs> So shamat, yes. Uh, Khiyah. Khiyah, you like cucumbers, which I recently learned is actually a fruit. Really? I didn't know that. I also recently learned that peanuts are not nuts. Anybody know that, or is it just me? Because you think like cashews, almonds, peanuts, it's not a nut. It's from the same family of adas, it's a legume. Did anybody know that, or is it just me in the dark? You knew that? It's because of uh, peanut allergies, and people have lentil allergies. Yeah. Right? Do people have lentil allergies? They do. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Huh. Okay. Anybody else know that? All right, I feel better now. Okay. All right, so, uh, but Khiyan, I just recently found out as a fruit, because it, uh, the, the way that it grows and so forth. What, uh, what else? What are some vegetables that you like? Pumpkin. Pumpkin. Okay, so pumpkin squash. So he likes squash. Uh, Dubba in Arabic or Qara, there's a number of, of names. I, I remember going to an Ikna West Sira zone, they don't have them anymore, at least I don't think they do, it was at MCA, and it was a speaker named Abdullah. So I could tell you exactly where he was standing, everything, like it's very clear as day. But he was talking about this, but he didn't just say the Prophet likes squash. I probably wouldn't have remembered that. He told us a story that in Sudan they have this, um, this tradition that every week they have a potluck, and everybody comes in and brings the food. And he said there was one person who hated squash. And whenever the plate was put on the, the, the tablecloth that they would put on the ground, he would get up and make a scene of getting away from that squash. And so he, he would, if it was placed here, he would get up and go to the other side and say, oh, I can't stand squash. One day they come to the, to, the, to the weekly potluck, and this man has gathered all of the dishes that have squash, put them in front of him, and is eating them and weeping. And they said, what happened? You were the person that was like, you know, anti-squash man, you know, 100%. He said, I found out the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to love squash. Now that makes it different than just say, the Prophet loves squash. So you can take an aspect of the seed. I don't have to embellish him. Oh yeah, maybe he cooked it in a clay pot and maybe he ate it with wheat. Like, I don't have to embellish that, you know. But just take a modern story Modern example, and, um, uh, and, and, and embed that seal story within it. Or the way a person might have applied the sunnah of a story. So I'm just trying to think off the top of my head. Um, um, okay, so if I told you, I mean this is more of a fifth discussion, but tahiyyatu masjid Mecca at tawaf The sunnah is normally in any masjid, you go to a masjid and you pray two rak'ahs of tahiyyah, right? To greet the masjid, which you're really greeting the owner of the house, which is Allah. When you go to Mecca, the tahiyyah is a tawaf, is going around the Kaaba seven times. You don't do two rak'ahs. So there was a, so now I could just say that, right? Tahiyyah of the masjid of Mecca is tawaf. All right. But I have a story that go like to embed it. So there was a, a scholar from Mauritania who had traveled across the Saharan Desert, went to Mecca. He studied that, he knows the sunnah, but when he got to Mecca, he started praying to rakats. And one of the locals of Mecca, who was not a scholar, said, Ya Shev, don't you remember that the tahiyyah of Masjid Mecca is a tawaf? And that's because he's a local and he's actually like practicing it all the time. And the Shaykh said, oh yeah, that's true, you're right. So that's a story where you, know, you can take one thing and, and embed it within another story. Was that Rabbul Hajj? No, it wasn't, no, yeah. 
Okay, we only have like a... Uh, okay, so let's let's end with like modern context. So we said we're going to stay away from political context unless you can boil it down to the core of that issue, which that takes a little bit of experience. So try to to avoid it. But some modern context, like what are some what are some issues that we're dealing with in society, modern society, that we should be discussing in our focus that you should hear. So we have the general uh, topics of like. You know, from the seed on the story, but what are some current events that are repetitive that we really need to talk about in our societies that are not being spoken about in our book list? And we're spe speaking specifically like high school, college, uh, Jumans. Uh, oppression on Muslims. What's that? Oppression on Muslims. Okay, oppression of Muslims. Oppression, and maybe of Muslims, but also general people, right? Oppression. You might go to a chuppah and somebody's like, oh, I want to give a chuppah about Black Lives Matter. <laughs> What's one of the problems with that? Hmm? No, what's one of the problems with giving a Black Lives Matter football? Too specific. Or? It's too specific. Can you can you address the exact same issues and topics that the Black Lives Matter is, is trying to address? Yes, by all means. And should we address it? Yes. But try to get to the core issue and make it relevant to uh, to to the community. So stay maybe, right. maybe xenophobia is captured all of that, or is that separate? Yeah, like we could talk about xenophobia. So. Because this also ties into the identity things, like, okay, uh, are you as a Muslim in your, are, are you hiding your Islam? Are you afraid to show your Islam because of xenophobia? Just last week, somebody, in this was in Fremont, I was in my car in the turning lane, there's a, two other people, two other lanes, and a few cars back, and I heard the person yell out at me, you beeping rabbi. <laughs> <laughs> So, is there anti-Semitism? Yeah. <laughs> Just because a, a person with white skin has a beard and a kufi on, he's automatically Jewish? Okay. Which I've gotten that before. One time I was checking ingredients at Whole Foods, and I was lifting it up, and I was looking at the... Because you know how they put the ingredients on the bottom of the cake? Somebody came by, oh, shalom. <laughs> Why, uh, it's not just the Egyptian movies then. I mean, which one? I mean, this... this uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so okay, what are some other ones, like, specific to the youth? Yeah. Racism, yeah, so we can put that under, like, racism. Does anybody know what xenophobia means? Yeah, zero fear of others. It's basically sweeping through the entire developed world, like Trump and in Europe, every place is getting more and more nativist, right? So Yeah. So we can talk about that, like, you can relate it to uh, uh, stories of the sea the the, uh, uh, the the embargo of Beni Hashim, and how do the Muslims deal with that, and so forth. Um, what are some other topics? Identity. Identity, okay. So you can maybe like, uh, we talked about that, but let's just put that identity. Probably wasting a lot of time over social media. Ah, that's a good one, yeah. Wasting time. That's a really good one. Especially social media. And especially in this age, where you guys, like, now the, the people going into high school and uh, in college, they like, <laughs> They were on social media before they finished drinking milk from bottles and stuff, right? Like they're grown up in this t complete thing, but on Instagram all the time. And yeah, that I think that is something like really big, like uh, addiction to screens and social media and building up self-esteem based on social media, all of that stuff. Like really, like uh, 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 dealing with that. But you don't want to get too specific and say. And so you should only be on your phones half an hour a day. Well, you know that's that's not like just keep it. We have an issue, social media. What are some of the, the, just get to some of the core issues and keep it general. What else? Respect. Respect. Respect, yeah. So there's a lot. One of the things, respect of others. And at the, at the, at the, at the, uh, uh, at the top of that is parents. Because one of the signs of the end of time, according to the Prophet, some say there's a, a weakness in the, the chain of that hadith. But... The meaning of sound, which is one of the signs of the end of time, is this respect of parents. And this applies to adults as well. Adults will, uh, you know, fully grown adults will will, uh, will disrespect their parents, but also young adults deal with this too. Especially because in social media, in media at large, in the general, uh, the general trend is, is to, is to ex be accepting of some of this dis disrespect of parents. What else? How about motivating our kids to go and do more research and develop. 
Uh, of what, of just in general, of anything? Yeah, because Muslims, they are very much behind in research and development. So okay, more so that's more like career career things, right? Or even taking advantage. Yeah, I mean, having that thought process uh, towards research and development, because we are not in there. Other people. Okay, are in so that's more of like a long a long term. Right? Yeah, so I would say that's kind of like um, so R and D, um, innovation. We thought um, we start thinking about the creation of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala and see you know how things are working. Yeah, and this leads into even like career choice, right? Because when you're giving your khutbas at high school or college level, people are in that stage where they're kind of uh, uh, filling in the last stages of their identity and even choosing their career choice, right? So, for example, and correct me if, you're, uh, if I'm wrong and understand this. If everybody in the Muslim community is going into engineering and medicine, are we doing R&D in other areas that we need development on? We're not. So you can talk about, reach into the history, you know, the Muslim history and the golden age of where the Muslims were. They were leaders, and they were thought leaders, and they broke new ground, they were pioneers. You can, you know, talk about a lot of that, which has a practical application. You're not going to tell them, don't go into medicine, or go into medicine, or don't go into law. You're just going to give a general thing like, think deeply about your career and look at what the Muslims used to do. Is that kind of what you're? Exactly. Yeah. So one of the uniqueness of the uniqueness of the Quran and Islam in general is that we never had a conflict with science, and it's actually the Quran that encouraged us to pursue the natural sciences. Yes. Whereas in Christianity, it's it's opposite. You know, the right, Bible right. actually forced them to stay away. On exactly. The interpretation yeah. And of that's something that can come up in in, the, in this discussion. I would stay away from maybe making that at the chutbah. Of saying, you know, the Christians did this, the Muslims did this, because you might have Christians in the audience. You know, the and so reason, forth. Yeah. Well, the reason for a positive, um, you know, stance is this is something that people have this fear that if I become a scientist, I have to give up my faith. Okay, yeah, and I see what you're saying. Yeah, so, exactly. so that actually that well, uh, that leads into another thing, uh, but is you know, uh, uh, science, science, right? So the uh, reconciling science, uh, evolution. I mean, even today we're finding things in the Quran that. We just now, very new discoveries, right? I mean, the, the most recent discovery in astrophysics, for example, yes. how the universe was born. We're finding, you know, very general statements in the Quran that once we understand astrophysics, now we can make that connection. Even right. Today, new things are coming out. And that's something that a person might be able to bring in. I would just uh, just caution on a couple of things. One, um, uh, if when you bring it in, try to keep it as, as general as possible because if you zero in too much uh, on it. They might, you know, somebody, somebody might say, oh, look, the Quran proved that the earth was a globe long before they, they thought that. Well, honestly, there's also proof in the Quran that it's flat. And for many centuries, Muslims thought, many Muslims thought the earth was flat, and they used Quranic evidence. So just one word of caution when we, use, when we look at the, the, the Quran and science, yes, there is definitely evidence, like the... the uh, the nebula and the Quran describing them as you know kawar that and you know the, the the explosion of the stars is like a uh, like a rose. There's evidence and you can bring that up, but just be careful to go too specific because you might have somebody that says actually you know that's and, not. And science itself is evolving, right? The yeah. Quran is not. Sorry, let me just, we only have 15 more minutes, so I want to just give to everybody in the the group. Yes. Oh, right. Sorry, I've been watching your lecture online all oh, day here. Thank sorry. You. Um, I think one of the big thing is uh as is identifying and explaining um, real uh, rights for women in Islam. Okay, rights for women. Yeah. Get mixed up sometimes. Now, the only thing that also that I would say of right, that like when we get into some of these topics, is that um, don't get too specific, right? Because at the, the high school, college level, you know, you might we might just leave it as like the the, the farewell book of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And let's list out what he said. And one of the things was rights of women, and just talk about it in general. But if we if we get if we go down into too specifics, too much specifics in this, a person really has to have studied some of the specifics to have a uh, uh, to to properly convey what Islam said about that. Um, so to to refer to what the scholars have said about that. So look, uh, but just trying to say yes, there is the rights of uh, the, the rights of women, and here are some of the things. That they had voting rights, that they were involved in the military, and so forth. And just stay, uh, stay very general. Uh, what are some other ones? If we just went, just really quickly in terms of like, uh, and I think, sister, thank you for sharing this one. This one is a really big one, 
because the people who are attacking us right now are the um, the ultra feminists. The ultra feminists. And so, as our sisters are going into um, the universities, the, the 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 far left and the feminists have really infiltrated a lot of the Western education system and academia, and it's seeped down to even um, uh, public schools and public schooling. So. There's some people who would leave the practice of Islam or actually leave Islam altogether because of this point. Oh, your Islam is patriarchy and it you know, uh, uh, takes away the rights of women. So they do have to have a good understanding of this. I'll give you one example. A friend of mine, he's a chaplain at a, at a, at a, at a college on the East Coast, and he said, like clockwork, there is a, uh, a class on women and gender studies that is taught by a lady with ultra-left feminist leanings and so forth, and like clockwork, Muslim sisters go into her class wearing hijab, come out not wearing hijab. Clockwork. People go in there as Arabs, coming out as self-hating Arabs because Islam is an Arab hegemony. Like, they will present that this religion is not a religion of diversity, and it's not in the the most noble of you are the most uh, God-fearing. No, this is actually an Arab religion where the top is, are the Arabs, and everybody else has to dress like them, speak like them, their Quran is in Arabic, and so forth. That's, he told, he's a chapter. This is happening now. So that's one thing, too, that is a side comment. When people at MSAs, don't do a khutbah on music and halal meat. Just that's the, that's what everybody's like, okay, I'm going to become a better practicing Muslim. I need to, you know, music is haram, and I have to stop eating, you know, meat from McDonald's. Okay, those are issues we can discuss with them. What are the scholarly, the, the but that's not the core issue. The core issue is somebody, are they prepared to go into a university and be hit with all of these, you know, other ideologies and know how to respond? Does that make sense? So, yes, I think this definitely needs to be explored. I will add another one up, which is mental health. Talk about mental health and also bring back specifically like suicide. Because it's increasing amongst our, our youth. And there's one Faith Network Alliance that I'm a part of their, um, uh, their, their newsletter. And they ask faith communities to dedicate at least one khutbah, or sorry, one uh, sermon a year to suicide. We have 52 uh, khutbahs or Sunday sermons in our faith communities. We should have at least one khutbah a year about suicide. Uh, now, I would just caution, like at, at the MSAs, if you do this topic, speak with a professional first. We have the Khalil Center here in the Bay Area. Um, I have actually suggested to them, you know, to do some sort of like chutzpah training. But this is, you know, you might just say, uh, if you're if you're dealing with some thoughts, you know, reach out. You can have a general chutzpah about reaching out. Um, but I think there's uh, any other, just really quick, we can list them. System. Oh, drug use, addiction. If you go to many churches, they have AA and NA meetings in the church. In the church. What would happen in our Muslim communities if we have a, an addictions uh, a group meeting over here? Yeah. We are not going to have developed a community until we say, look, everybody's struggling with something. And if a person is struggling, some people are genetically predisposed to addiction. It's like genetically predisposed to heart condition, genetically predisposed to uh, addiction. It's not removing the responsibility that they have to do, but it's understanding it's not a simple thing. So, yes, talk about addiction. And they're using You're at Doherty Valley, right, brother? Yeah. Our people use Yeah. It's, it's an issue over there. So, um, and other, who's at Cal High? Actually, I heard from all of the high schools here. Like, all the high schools, all the Muslims, somebody's got an issue with drug addiction. So, yeah, they have a football on that. What else? What are some other ones? Excessive materialism or just materialism? Um, yeah, uh, talk about materialism, but maybe, like, uh, the only thing that I would caution about materialism, you know, we, the Muslims, we usually talk about it, dunya, 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 right? Dunya's bad, dunya's bad, dunya's bad. Well, what is it? This is actually a really complex topic. Um, uh, so just be careful of a, of a topic like that, because... You know, somebody might say, oh yeah, too much dunya, you shouldn't buy a brand new phone, you should get refurbished. That's going from, yes, 
there is a, you should be cautious of the dunya, but the dunya can also be good, you know, don't get into saying, oh yeah, you shouldn't buy MacBook, book pros, because they read, raise the prices and uh, reduce the, uh, uh, the inputs, the outlets on there, which that's now I'm just venting my frustration with Apple. <laughs> Any other topics? Yes. Gender roles, which goes down here maybe, rights of women and gender roles. Uh, some of these I would say need a, a need more developed, like like the previous our previous uh, list that we had. Those were really general enough to where you didn't have to have a lot of knowledge about it. But some of these, um, I would say, out of this, like a lot of these are complex. Like how would we, okay, this is this is simple, you can tackle this simply. How would somebody in high school or college, like what are some, let's just say three of these that the average Muslim in high school could could tackle it in the khutbah? The wasting time and social media. Wasting time, yeah, that one's not. What else? Respect. Uh, respect the parents. Parents, yeah. Drug addiction. Woman What's that? Right? Drug addiction. Drug addiction, yeah. Because that's pretty clear cut, right? Identity. Identity? Women's right now. Basically, all things that affect a of a student's woman. life. Rights of women. I would say. I would say System. this one is. You just want to make sure that the person is presenting it correctly, because we have a lot of cultural understandings. We have a lot of uh, you know, like what if somebody says, uh, you know, I just I think this one should be should should be approached with caution because you don't want to misrepresent the dean. And you don't want to offend people, which usually will happen. You'll offend people when you misrepresent the dean. So this is not, uh, uh, you know, I think, I think ING, that's another, that's a good resource for you guys. ING does a lot of um, work on discuss, uh, this, uh, addressing some of these topics. So if you have not done the ING um, uh, training, they have material on their website. Look at the ING material because they address these, like, especially like this one. These two right here, so they've had people look at that. So look at other material, and that's another thing you can do with your chutbas too. Watch other people's chutbas, and uh, if they're if they're recognized scholars and so forth, and you can take uh, some people actually what they do is they just listen to a chutba, take notes, and deliver it again. There's no problem with that too. So you can do that as well. Copyright. What's that? Yeah, no copyrights. Belli <laughs> The Prophet said, convey from me even if it's one hand. So that kind of, anything religious related is not, there's no copyrights on it. I'm going to get in trouble for that one, but I'll take the heat. Um, no copyrights on the deen. Um, this one, maybe, maybe somebody can, you know, keep it in terms of like evolution. Like, well, we don't believe, we didn't come from apes. Simple. Well, the proof of this and that. Oh, listen, this is we didn't come from apes, but be ready for the blowback on that one. Uh, <laughs> trans hmm? uh, trans yeah, I would say these ones just approach with caution. The signs, just to make sure that the person is uh, uh, knows that they're they're. Um, this one might be also a little bit. I guess everything is getting kind of complicated up there, my notes. All right, any final questions? I know it was like in three minutes. Any final questions? Okay, well, alhamdulillah, I think we uh, we went through everything. The video is going to be on, uh, it is recorded, it should be on the website uh, soon. And we will, some of the, the links and the resources, I think somebody asked about that listing of the 100 uh, character topics. Um, I think this this page right here on the social, uh, just take everything I think listed on here can be a, might be approached simply, but just realize you're treading on a little bit more thin ice than those other topics when you go very specific. So ING is a good uh, source to see how have uh, Muslim scholars uh, and, and Muslim researchers addressed these to, to be presented. Uh, ING does a speaker's training as well, um, so you can you can look into that. Uh, okay. Jazakum al khair. Thank you everyone for, for attending and to MCC for hosting this. And inshallah we look forward to 
seeing more hookless and also here at MCC during the summer, or actually not in the summer, but like September, October, August, September, October, and November, those four months, they have the third Jum'ah where they have youth khatibs and they need more youth khatibs. So uh, anybody who's interested in doing hookless, um, as you get more experience, you know, just reach out to, to myself or to Munir and if you'd like to get into uh, doing hookless here for the third khutbah. And then for the sisters, um, you know, writing the content, you can write the content and the brothers can deliver it, so make sure that you have that collab collaboration. Um, and I think it'll be... What I wanted to do, we didn't really have this time, maybe we can do a, the second part of the series where people actually do some like role-playing khutbahs. And you can give the khutbahs and now everybody can say, okay, you missed this point of the fifth, you did, you missed this sunnah, you know, you, you, you did this, you said this would, could, be, um, uh, could be offensive, this point is wrong. So maybe we'll do a second session in a couple of months, uh, once you've had some more training. Are you doing hookahs at your high school? Yeah. You are? You are as well? I am. Oh, okay, you know, all right. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll maybe schedule a second session where we do um, uh, a practical application. Alright, subhanAllah wa ma'am wa bihamdika wa nashadu 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 wa nashadu